Steve. Good morning, my lady. Today's witness is Matt Hancock. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Mr Hancock, may I give you the same apology I've given other witnesses we've had to call back. I'm sorry that the modular structure means that we have to keep imposing on you, but uh, thank you for coming. Not at all. Um, could you commence your evidence, please, by giving us your full name? Yes, I am Matthew John David Hancock. Mr Hancock, you are the MP for West Suffolk, and, of course, we've received evidence uh, in Module 1 from you that you are... Uh, Paymaster General and Minister for the Cabinet Office from May 15 to July 16. And then you served as Secretary of State for Health and Social Care from the 9th of July 2018 when you took over from Jeremy Hunt MP uh, and you served in that post to the 26th of June 2021 when you resigned. That's right. Um, thank you for the provision of a further statement. You obviously provided a great deal of information for the purposes of Module 1, and you gave evidence, uh, and you have further assisted by providing uh, a lengthy statement, 176 pages, uh, which we can see there on the screen, uh, and also a supplementary statement. You were good enough to respond to a number of additional areas that the inquiry put to you. Um, and I just want to put into place, please, some of the, the, the building blocks necessary for the questioning that will follow. The inquiry has, I should make plain, received a copy of your book, Pandemic Diaries, which obviously uh, consists of a, a significant contribution to the debate about the response to coronavirus. Can I just please ask you, though, to make plain that notwithstanding that it is entitled Pandemic Diaries, it is, to use your words, an account pieced together from formal papers contemporaneous notes and voice memos, WhatsApps and communications and interviews. That's right. It's written as contemporaneous rather than with hindsight, uh, but it was written after the pandemic using contemporaneous materials. Yes. So stylistically, it is not a diary. It is re-pieced together and called a diary. Correct. It's my recollections. In the diaries, so-called, and, and in your statement... You make plain that the remit of the Department of Health and Social Care was a vast one. It had, of course, all its usual business. It was the lead government department in response to this national public health crisis. And the obligations upon it were, to use your words, vast and fast-paced. Yes. In Module 1, you accepted in the course of your evidence under oath that there had been a serious and significant inadequacy of preparation within the DHSE for a pandemic health emergency. May the inquiry take from that acceptance that on the cusp of the pandemic in January 2020, the absence of preparation had serious significant consequences in terms of the DHSE's ability to be able to respond? Well, of course, as Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, I was responsible not just for the department, but ministerially responsible for the wider health family as well, the agencies, of course, the biggest being the NHS itself um, and Public Health England and others. And it is absolutely true, as I set out in my evidence in Module 1, that the plans that we had were not adequate. Um, the, the, uh, and and I, as we discussed in Module 1, that was, I think, on two bases. The first is, in, in practical terms, for instance, the UK didn't have a significant testing capability. And in terms of the wrong doctrine, which was that all the planning based on the 2011 pandemic flu plan onwards was based on the assumption that we'd be dealing with the consequences of a pandemic rather than trying to suppress a pandemic. 
does it follow from the absence of preparation and, and perhaps the way in which, in terms of planning, the department, as well as the rest of government, may be said to have been pointing in the wrong direction? That when the DHSC and yourself were required to address the crisis and, and the breaking of the crisis in, in January and February, it became apparent that in terms of the structure, the personnel, the resourcing, the money, as well as the absence of plans to deal with the coronavirus, that, that you were in, in very real difficulties. Well, a couple of points on that. The first is I take issue with absence of a plan. There wasn't an absence of a plan. There were plans. Uh, they were, I've critiqued the plans. Uh, I've said that they weren't adequate, but there were uh, plans in place. There was the 2011 pandemic plan that had been the Cygnus exercise under Jeremy Hunt's uh, uh, position as Secretary of State. Um, so there were uh, plans. There were areas in which the response, early response, was very strong. Uh, PHE uh, got a diagnostic test together within a matter of days. Um, the early surveillance, um, essentially led by Professor Van Tam, as he's given evidence, um, was uh, very good, and our role, the UK's role internationally, strong uh, in the first few weeks. So there were plans, the, but the plans were inadequate in ways that we discussed in Module 1. With respect directly to the impact of that on the department, of course, when a pandemic strikes, even if you had the very best plans, um, the, 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 those responsible for responding would have to would have to strengthen the operation, would have to tool up. Uh, and in the, in the early days, we, we um, expanded the department very uh, significantly, and we, we ultimately we brought in um, army personnel, for instance, uh, lots more clinical personnel, others. Um, and we, we took people off non-pandemic-related work and put them onto pandemic-related work. All of these things were in response to the pandemic. Um, they would have been needed whether we had, if, even if we have the perfect plan, even if we learn all the lessons, next time uh, there is a pandemic and there will be another one, uh, that of course the Department for Health will have to shift to respond to those challenges. You say there were plans and, and you're, you're astute to make the point that there was a plan, the 2011 pandemic flu strategy. But your statement itself says, and I quote it, there was no book or report to pull off a shelf to tell us how to handle a pandemic. Yes. So, of course, as with responding to any crisis or emergency faced by government, the absence of a book or report to tell you how to do it yeah. is going to have an impact on your practical efficiency, on your ability to respond. That, that's obvious, isn't yes. it? Yes. This was the first major pandemic in living memory, there wasn't anybody who'd responded to it. None of my living predecessors as Secretary of State had had to deal with something on this scale. Indeed. You are aware, of course, from the witness statement of Mark Sedwell, now Lord Sedwell, the Cabinet Secretary, that in a report to the Prime Minister in the summer of 2020, he said the DHSC was neither structured nor resourced for a public health crisis of this magnitude. Granted, it, it's, it's a very broad observation, and, and it doesn't, of course, deal with the institutional links between the DHSC and the NHS and Public Health England, or the scientific advisory structure, or, of course, the possibility that there would be movements in personnel and a ramping up in funding for the department. But in a broad sense, that is a a correct proposition, is it not? Structurally and in terms of resourcing, when the crisis broke, the DHSC was under par. Well, it, he didn't use the words under par. They're your words. Um, and I would reject that because the senior personnel in DHSC were absolutely superb and rose to the challenge. Um, but it's blazingly obvious that when a pandemic strikes, the health department is going to have more to do. And so I regard that comment as, uh, as, as um, very straightforward. All right. Could we have 273901, page 78? This is an extract from Sir Patrick Valence's diaries. 
dated the 3rd of June 2020, Quad Call exposed the massive internal operational mess inside DHSE and PHE. Could we have page 587? Also, clear lack of grip in DHSE. This is in July. Very good at analysis, no grip on actions, said Will. Page 594. Email from within DHSC describes it as ungovernable and a web of competing parts. And I'll summarize, there are other diary entries in Sir Patrick Vallance's evening notes where he says it's clear that once again, DHSC has done nothing. <clears throat> People lobbing in points, no clear operational accountability, and so on. Regardless of what reasonable mitigation might be offered, and there is obviously mitigation which may be offered, senior officials in government continue to express concern over a number of months. Lord Sedwell, Sir Patrick Vallance and others, Helen McNamara, about the state of the DHSC, correct? Well, I don't know whether these parts of um, Sir Patrick's diaries were uh, contemporaneous, because I know that some was written after the event. Um, well, can I the, just pause you there with respect? These were evening notes made certainly more contemporaneously than your diary, Pandemic Diaries book. The vast majority were written on the day or the day after. Only some, it is apparent, were written later. Yes, yeah, so uh, as I say, we don't know whether these are contemporaneous, but that is by the by. Um, the point here, I think, in response is that when you have an enormous unprecedented event, um, the department that is um, in the forefront of responding to it, of course, is going to do its best to rise to that challenge. And that's what the DHSC did. Did everything go right? Of course it didn't. And you wouldn't expect it to. Um, it is natural for the centre, the uh, Cabinet Office, to be sceptical of departments. That's what I was the Cabinet Office Minister, as you've noted. The culture of the Cabinet Office is to be sceptical of the operation of departments, partly to hold them to account. Um, I think that the toxic culture that you've seen at the centre of government that's been subject of much discussion was unhelpful in assuming that when anything was difficult or a challenge, um, therefore there was somehow um, fault and blame. That, was, that is a part of the toxic culture that we've seen. Um, and, is, and, and some of these uh, exhibits that you've just shown uh, demonstrate a... Uh, a lack of um, uh, generosity or empathy in understanding the difficulty of rising to such a big challenge. So did the DHSC need to expand and grow? Of course. Did, every, did it get everything right? Uh, no, of course not. Um, there were, no doubt we'll go into individual challenges. Um, but did it rise to the challenge overall of responding to the biggest public health crisis in a century? I think it did. If you look at the successes, for instance, on the growth of testing once the department took that over, uh, getting the vaccine rollout up and running, various other projects. So, you know, I, I, we can go through all of the detail. In terms of lessons learned, we need to, we, what is crucial is that any department in future is ready to go. And I'll make one final point, if I may, which is relevant to your question. At the start of the pandemic, the department, including me, was trying to wake up Whitehall to this threat. And early on, the department ended up doing things which really aren't for a health department. But we were doing them because nobody else was. Could you just give us yeah, I'll one give you, or two I'll examples? I'll give you one example. The, uh, um, the, um, Shielding the Vulnerable is a program that eventually was run very, very well by Chris Townsend, who was brought in from outside, and MHCLG departmentally. Um, it was about how to get groceries to people, how to make sure that people got support, including from volunteers, um, how to make sure we looked after those who were the most vulnerable. 
That is clearly a cross-government effort and rightly led from a department that isn't the health department. But it was, I had to commission the work to get that going from the health department. Similarly, the view over whether or not to close schools ended up, and, and the NPIs ended up within the health department early on. Now, that was taken back to the, um, uh, the CTF, uh, back into the Cabinet Office, um, and rightly so. So the department, yes, had a huge amount to do, but I would argue that because the rest of Whitehall was slow getting going, we had to get up there and do it. And if that led to criticisms from those in the centre of government, then, you know, frankly, uh, I'd far rather that we did step up and take that responsibility, um, e even though it brought us flack later and evidently flack at the time that I wasn't aware of, these, because these issues were never raised with me personally. Scepticism. Is that a reference to, and we'll, we, you know very well that we're coming to this a little later, the, the notion that individuals in central government were, were critical of your department because they had taken again you, they were tarring your department with the same brush as they were you, that there was a, a campaign, if you like, of spite and aggression against you and your department. Is that what you're suggesting by the notion that there was scepticism towards the DHSE? Well, there is healthy scepticism of the centre of government of departments in which they challenge, hold to account, uh, and generally try to keep departments moving forward. Now, I've been, I, I, as a Cabinet Office Minister, one of my roles was to make sure departments were delivering on uh, what they'd said that they would deliver. Um, we have seen from the emails that I wasn't, and the messages I wasn't aware of at the time, um, that clearly flipped over into an unhealthy, toxic culture at the centre, um, where any, um, anything that went wrong was seen as an almost intentional failure. Um, and worse, that amongst some people, misinformation about what the department was delivering was spread, including to the Prime Minister and at the very highest levels. So a, a healthy culture involves challenge and, and, and scepticism. Um, an unhealthy, toxic culture involves um, a, a failure properly to engage and instead throwing of uh, false allegations and um, and extremely unpleasant language. What you'll notice when you go through all of the documents is you just didn't have that within the health family. I tried to lead a, you know, a, a positive uh, culture, a can-do culture, where if, you, you, where if there was a problem, the question that was raised in the department was, how do we fix this? Um, now, that didn't happen all of the time. Of course, there were moments of frustration. Uh, but that was my overall attitude in this area. I led... Um, and you can see, unfortunately, that we, we rubbed up against this, um, this deep unpleasantness at the centre. If I may say so, you're doing extremely well, Mr Hancock, in terms of the speed of your response. Could you, however, try to be a little bit more concise in your answers? I will. I asked you deliberately to give the inquiry some examples of where you feel that the DHSC had excelled. And you've referred to testing and you've referred to the vaccination programme uh, and also to shielding. The testing, it is self-evident, what was a process that was underway and, and a great deal of time and energy was devoted to it throughout 2020. But it really only reached its fruition later in the year. Yeah. Vaccination, obviously, was a matter only from 2021, largely. And shielding was... A no, no, the work on vaccination started in January 2020. And DHSC, of course, didn't... No, Mr. Mr Hancock, will you please wait for the question? The vaccination programme was rolled out, of course, in 2021. And, and it's obvious that work was done on commissioning it and funding it and so on in advance. That's self-evident. But the shielding programme was a cross-government exercise led both by the DHSE and the General Public Services Ministerial Im Implementation Group, latterly. But in the early part of the year, so we're focusing, of course, in this module, particularly on January, February, March, April, evidence has been given that the DHSE 
focus too much on itself and on the acute health system, NHS, as opposed to the wider long-term health of the public. By that, I mean a reference to, and the witness meant a reference to, health control, to infection control, to the core issue in the first part of the year of dealing with the spread of the virus. Do you think that the DHSC on this crucial issue of infection control, of dealing with that part of the public health crisis, was up to the mark? Yes. Now, in Sir Patrick Vallance's records uh, and in the evidence of Helen McNamara, there are repeated references to how in February and March you were, quote, desperate to own and lead, that you kept too much in the DHSC, that you were reluctant to explain that there was a risk of the NHS becoming overwhelmed, and you were bad at asking the Cabinet Office for help. You were aware of the material. Does that not all rather suggest that in those vital days of January through to March, the DHSC failed to tell central government how bad it was and what could be done to address the question of infection control? No, that's completely the wrong way around. Um, from the middle of January, uh, we were trying to effectively raise the alarm. Um, we were trying to wake up Whitehall to the scale of the problem. Um, and this was a problem that couldn't be addressed only from the health department. Uh, Non-pharmaceutical interventions cannot be put in place by a health department. A health department can't shut schools. It should have been grasped and led from the centre of government earlier. And you've seen evidence that repeatedly the department, across the department, and I tried to make this happen. Um, and we were on occasions blocked. And at other times, um, I would say we were... Um, we were, we, our, our, our concerns were not taken as seriously as they should have been until the very end of February. So, for instance, the very first time I tried to call a COBRA, I was blocked, ultimately only for 48 hours, because I then went to get other voices to call for a COBRA, um, and it happened. Um, and getting the machine at the centre of government up and running was incredibly hard and took a huge amount of effort. When it did finally get up and running at the end of uh, February, um, then things started to move. The, uh, and so I've heard these accusations that we tried to do too much. On the contrary, there was so much that needed to be done, and in some cases we just had to get on and do it. Uh, it would have been far better if instead of thinking that we were overreacting as the um, as the, the Cobra machine clearly thought we were, um, if they had embraced the challenges um, and it had been led from the centre. If I think to, you know, had there been under another uh, regime, under another cabinet secretary, you know, it, 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 I was, I've been, I was a minister under David Cameron, under Theresa May. Um, if, you know, the, the centre would have chaired those early Cobras. Yes, of course, I, as Secretary of State, uh, would have played a big part, but it would have been a cross-government effort. And in future, that's what, it, that's what it should be. The lead government department model works very well for small crises, for medium-sized crises, uh, but it does not work for a crisis that is a whole of government, indeed a whole of society crisis. We'll come back to COBRA, and, and you're aware, of course, that I'll be asking you about particular COBRA meetings. You've given an example there of of COBRA, and you've put it in the context of the difficulties in getting the government machine going until the end of February. Yes, at the centre. The department was working full-time on this from the middle of January. If it was hard to get the government machine going, and you've referred to the effort required and the difficulties that you encountered, may we take it from that that the system took time to, give, to be geared up at the centre of government? Yes. Presumably, there was an avoidable delay, therefore, baked into this governmental system. If it took time to get it going to react appropriately and sufficiently, then time would have been lost. Well, to be fair, 
the early actions that were needed were essentially health department and health, the health family actions, developing the early test, uh, making sure that we supported the universities who were developing the, uh, the, the vaccines. Um, the very early contact tracing, the responses to the individual cases. You know, the, the first um, cases didn't come to the UK until um, the very end of, uh, of, of January, start of February. Um, and so the early actions were for the department. So I thought it, it was reasonable, for instance, the very first COBRA that I should chair it. Um, but there was a point when we needed to go broader than things that ought to be the remit of the department. My argument, my point, in response to these um, allegations that we held too much within the department um, or that we uh, didn't get on with stuff, is we, ha uh, um, we were, um, somebody's accused the department of being overwhelmed. Well, we were certainly whelmed. We were certainly very, very busy. And we were having to do things that in future ought to be done by other departments or at the centre because it should have been a whole government response uh, earlier. That's my, that's my reflection. And what about after the end of February? So March and April, yeah. as the cross-government machine ramps up, yeah. as the scale of the crisis is, is finally understood and steps have to be taken, to what extent have the DHSE got on top of coordinating or promoting or suggesting the sorts of countermeasures and infection control measures that ultimately were at the heart of the government's response? Well, so by, from, from the end of February, when the, um, uh, when the Prime Minister took the chair at COBRA, which was symbolically very important, uh, when the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster uh, got stuck in, and you heard from him how he came to a COBRA, um, was alarmed, um, asked some very good questions, followed that up with me, and from and and uh, you might think that I was uh, unhappy to receive that email and those questions. On the contrary, I was delighted, and he and after a discussion about where we were up to, he became a very very strong ally in driving action all the way through the the crisis. Um, the um, so from early March it, it shifted and it became a whole government effort. Um, of course. In March, April, the department continued to have to do much, much, much more and increasing amounts. Um, and so we were, we were under enormous pressure and enormous stress. Um, we brought in more resources, basically from wherever we could find them, um, and, um, uh, and did everything that we could. But it was that, but, you know, the, that ramp up was, was extremely difficult. Mr. Hancock, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I just ask you to rewind? Um, I didn't realise Mr Keith was moving on. Um, going back to the time before the end of February, <clears throat> and I appreciate you say that central government should have got involved earlier. Apart from the fact that other government departments would have done some of the work that you felt that your department had to, was anything not done? I appreciate you shouldn't have been doing it, you say, but was anything not done because central government wasn't involved earlier? Well, I think that... Um, for the future, the plans for what NPIs to put in place, for instance, that, that isn't a health department thing. And once we got the structures properly set up, it wasn't a health department thing. It was a, it was a cabinet office thing, quite rightly. Um, so it was, it was in um, mid to late February that the SAGE system got going on designing NPIs. And we also did some work on that in the department, um, in, especially in the, in the area of the legals that were needed. Um, that sort of work, you know, for, hopefully for next time, will already be on the books. You know, we should, we should, we should already have published um, uh, 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 legal draft um, uh, legislation, published draft legislation that is that is ready in case it needs to be enacted. Um, back then, we had, we thankfully, thanks to the preparation work, one of the areas of preparation work that went well, we had a draft bill. Uh, in future, that already should be published and scrutinised. So there's there's two examples: the legals and the and the NPI. M may we presume that, and, and you've just said it was it was an incredibly difficult task faced by the DHSC. Yeah. But by the beginning of March, as you were grappling with the emerging scientific advice as to the state of the transmission of the outbreak, how far it had got 
to what extent it had become sustained within the community in the United Kingdom. Yeah. Dealing with the absence of plans and, the, as you say in your book, having to formulate a battle plan, having to consider for the first time in in 100 years some of these extraordinarily stringent countermeasures, the, the DHSC must have been under very considerable stress. I mean, you, you, this was not a an, an obligation that you sought. You were a, a lead government department responding to a whole government crisis, a whole nation crisis. Yes. W was the DHSC under stress? Was it in difficulties at the beginning of March? It, it, we were under enormous stress. We were working incredibly hard, yes. Could we have 129226, please, which is a text from yourself to Boris Johnson on the 7th of March, page 2. He, he, he asks you... Anything I can do to help? You're doing great, keep going. And, and you say, kind of you to say, it's not easy. You're doing great too, follow the science. And you, you ask for help in relation to, or you invite him to, to start thinking about how he could contribute to a, a call for a public effort, a clarion call for, for hand washing and helping old folks if they have to stay home. It's a great unifying clarion call for you to lead when the time is right. W was that not a, an opportunity for you to say to the Prime Minister, well, we absolutely have to get on top of the very real difficulties with the absence of real plans for infection control, with the development and implementation of countermeasures, with the incredibly difficult issue of funding and planning for vaccines, shielding, all the other areas that your department was grappling with? Uh, by this point, the Prime Minister, the, um, uh, the Cabinet Office machine, and Number 10 were um, wholly engaged. Um, the, the Prime Minister, I think, chaired the first uh, COBRA on the 2nd of March. Um, and so we'd had almost a, a, a week of me being able to say, um, all of that. So uh, I think this was a. Um, uh, they, you know, I, uh, he asked if I can anything I can do to help, and I said we should have a whole national effort. So that pretty much covers all bases. And Mr. Hancock, you're aware that the very senior civil servant um, Helen McNamara, who was at one stage deputy cabinet secretary, described you in evidence as having nuclear levels of confidence which she thought was a problem. Do you reject the notion that in your dealings with your colleagues, in terms of the impression that you gave, you, you were overconfident in presenting the undoubtedly extraordinarily difficult issues that your department faced? It depends who with. Um, the, uh, I had... Um, enormous doubts at this point. Um, I would ask people I trusted for uh, advice. Um, I had long discussions with, for instance, uh, Chris Wormald, Chris Whitty, about how we were responding. Um, we were, in a trusted environment, we were, we were um, self-critical about how we were responding. That's only natural, because we could see what was happening, and we could see that we were in the middle of something that hadn't happened for, uh, for decades, and it was on our watch, so to speak. Um, it, it, it's also... Uh, I also thought it was necessary, and I can understand how some people will have interpreted the way that I now know that they did, although I didn't know this at the time, because nobody raised any of these issues with me at the time. I can now I can see how, you know, uh, my sense of needing to keep the driving the system forward um, might have had this impact on some people, um, who especially those who were more sceptical of the need of the government to act. Frankly, um, we have seen some of the evidence that the same people who were accusing me of overconfidence. Uh, at the same time, we're trying, we're blocking the action that I was saying was, we needed, um, and so you can, I, I can now see the dynamics of, 
if they were against action being taken, and I was going in and saying, we absolutely must do this, and I, you know, there was a huge amount of uncertainty and a huge amount of worry, and I basically felt it was my professional duty to try to keep going, to keep driving forward. Who was against action being taken? Well, we've, I, I don't want to point fingers because everybody was doing well, which, their best. W which government department significantly was against action being taken? Well, I, 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 the, for instance, um, the reluctance to get the Cobra machine going. Uh, we've seen some of the uh, evidence of certain individuals thinking that we were overreacting or the world had gone mad. Uh, there, was a, there was a delay, an inexplicable delay at the, at the centre to the publication of the action plan, which came on the 3rd, and we've seen some evidence of why that happened. So um, th there's various examples of it, but I basically felt that I had to drive this thing forward, and I felt that sense of responsibility. Of course, and I, you know, of course I understand that now that some people you know, um, reacted in the way that, that they did, um, but it was... But, but it was a time of enormous uncertainty and a time when I just felt we needed to keep driving this system forward. We will look at some of the areas, and indeed, in fact, all the areas that you've identified, Mr Hancock, where there may have been evidence of the government machine being delayed or, or of action not being taken when it could reasonably have been taken. M may the inquiry presume and, and conclude from what you've said that, about the difficulties in getting the government machine going, that there were these instances of people react, uh, pushing back or, or not doing perhaps what they should have done, that, that by and large there was overall, therefore, an avoidable delay well, it between, Sorry. between the beginning of February, and we'll look now at, at, at the material that was available to you and to the machine and the lockdown decision of the 23rd of March. There, it just didn't have to have been that long. Can I answer that question contemporaneously and then with hindsight? Contemporaneously, people were doing their jobs to the best of their ability. Um, uh, uh, the Cabinet Secretary had a reason for not wanting to call the Cobra unnecessarily, and it took 48 hours to... Uh, persuade him, and that's because he thought they were overused previously. He was worried that it was for use for communications purposes. I did not want it for communications purposes. I wanted it for substantive reasons to get the government machine moving. Um, there was people were get, had good reasons at the time, uh, and maybe because they weren't faced like I was with this with the daily evidence of this growing crisis. Um, they, they simply didn't cotton on to the fact that this enormous wave was coming. Um, so I don't think it's fair to criticise people for making professional judgments at the time. With hindsight, knowing what we know now, it's obvious to everybody uh, that the, there should have been a whole-of-government response from earlier. But you've got to remember the fog of uncertainty and the lack of data. And, you know, there weren't cases in the UK till the end of January. The first death in the UK, very sadly, in the UK was on the, on the 1st of March. So this was, this was very, very early on. You have described, Mr Hancock, how you saw the government machine trying to ramp itself up. You could see the difficulties that, your, on your evidence, the department and yourself encountered. You've given evidence about the instances in which people push back or where there may have been a failure to act reasonably speedily. So you must have been aware, you were the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, that things were not being progressed, as you, in your own words, would have wished. So you must have been aware of the delay. Yes. I, I don't... We, the inquiry has no interest in, in you trying to, uh, and, and, and rightly so, not identify individuals to blame. But you must have been aware that cross-government, systemically, the United Kingdom government was failing to respond sufficiently, speedily and well in this crisis. It's not a matter of hindsight. You could see it happening at the time. Well, I found frustrations in areas I wanted to put for, push forward at the time. The evidence I'm giving is that now, having seen it from the inside, 
Um, in, in many cases, people had reasonable um, uh, uh, arguments for why they were doing that. They were behaving professionally. There was, of course, also this very unpleasant toxic culture. Um, but I think that became a problem later rather than early on. I think it was just reasonable people doing their jobs saying, really? You know, there are known costs to the, the things that I was trying to do and unknown benefits, because at this point it might still have all been contained within China. So, so people saying, are you sure you want to do this? Do we really want to tell the public we might shut down whole cities? Well, yes, I did want to do that. Um, but I can under so I, I'm just trying to empathize with why people reacted the way that they did at the time. Now, you've mentioned plans, and the lack of planning is an, is an important part of the, um, the inquiry's um, uh, examination of this area. In your statement, and you've acknowledged it already, you observe that there was no book or report to pull off a shelf to tell us how to handle a pandemic. But in a WhatsApp message from you to Mr Cummings on the 12th of March, can we have 48313, page 68? In the context, Mr Hancock, to put this in, um, in its correct context, watching Question Time, we need to up at gear on winning the public argument. So, so it's in the context of the debate that was then rumbling on, yeah. in fact, about reasonable worst-case scenario, herd immunity, behavioural fatigue, and so on and so forth. Yeah. You say we are better prepared than other countries. By the 12th of March, you were surely aware that we were not better prepared than other countries. There was, and you've acknowledged it already, a complete understanding that there was no scaled-up test, trace, isolate, contact isolate system beyond the first few index, first few hundred cases. There was no effective means of infection control. There was no border plans or quarantine system in place. You knew there was sustained community transmission in the United Kingdom by this date, and you knew that the infection fatality rate was 1%. 1% of all infected people would die. Why did you say we are better prepared than other countries? Well, I think there's two ways to answer that question. Um, the first is this is about a uh, this is about a communications question, um, and the 12th of March was this was the 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 end of um, the uh, period in which we were concerned about the timing of uh, lockdown and making sure that we didn't go too early and the. Um, I changed my view on that on the 13th. Can I, can I, I don't wish to be being polite, just um, interrupt you there to say, is that a reference to the debate which rumbled on, in fact, for, for quite some time, about the risk of going too early in yes. terms of any countermeasures that might be implied? Yes, and for instance, I look back on the interview I gave on Sunday morning of the 1st of March when I said, of course, there's a risk of going too early. And the interviewer said, yes, well, of course, we all understand that. So this was a, a widely shared belief that, we, in hindsight, was wrong because our doctrine was wrong, as we discussed in, in the first um, uh, module. And so this is a, this is a comms recommendation to uh, the, the guy responsible for comms in, uh, in number 10. Um, as it happened, what I think this actually shows is the end of the road for this argument. This argument that we didn't need to move, we should wait, it was better to wait. Um, uh, this, um, uh, this, this, this argument um, came to its end, at, essentially, at this point. The, the point about it being a communications debate is, is well made. It, you're obviously being asked in the context of watching question time. Yeah. Your evidence so far, Mr Hancock, has been very much the effect of the, the, the DHSC was a, a siren voice calling for more to be done, for trying to push the government machine on. But by the 12th of March, as you knew very well, the United Kingdom government had reached the end, even, even by that late stage, of the containment phase of the strategy. The virus was rife. Should you not have been taking this opportunity to tell your colleagues in government, telling the public, telling the citizens of this nation, 
this wall of death is coming and we have no effective means to deal with it other than to impose infection control measures urgently and significantly. Well, in my public communications, you will know that I had at that point been um, explaining that we might have to do that, yes. Um, the, but I'm also a team player and the government position was not yet. So this was a message about how to best I explain the government position of not yet. But as I say, the, the position of not yet was running to the end of its road. And um, it was on the, the very next day that I um, first told the Prime Minister that I thought that we needed to lock down. Was that the 13th of March? Correct. It's not in your diary, so-called, I should say, Mr Hancock. The entry for the 13th of March makes no reference to you telling the Prime Minister this vital piece of information that he should lock down immediately. There is a whole page on how you woke up for the dawn flight to Belfast and Edinburgh Airport. Yeah. There was, from the Prime Ministerial meeting, Prime Ministerial papers, a video call 9.30 that morning, and according to your book, you say, I called the Prime Minister and told him we'd have to do some very rapid backpedalling on the issue of herd immunity. Yeah then rang Patrick, who promised to do his best to repair the damage. Yeah. You then met with First, Ministers in, in, uh, First Minister in Belfast. You then went to Cardiff and so on. Yes. Telling the Prime Minister of this country for the first time that he had to call an immediate lockdown is, is surely worthy of some recollection, is it not? Uh, I, I didn't have full access to my... Uh, papers for writing of that, and this came to light uh, in looking in in researching the papers ahead of this inquiry. This is, after all, the formal public inquiry. So what then it. happened is that was on the 13th, which was the Friday. On the 14th, we then had the we had formal meetings in the cabinet room on this subject, um, and I again made my views very clear. But if you think if you you know this. This, this shift from we should wait because we've got to get the timing right to we must act now happened, happened quickly. So, for instance, on the 13th of March, there was a G7 call with my... Um, and I was very struck, especially by my uh, Italian opposite number, because they had put in place the lockdown... Um, across the whole of Italy by then, and he was describing where they were up to, and it was, uh, it, it was, it was harrowing. Forgive me. Your book says, the account that follows has been meticulously pieced together from my formal papers, notes, voice memos, my communications, WhatsApps, we know from the press, and it records in 555 pages, all the relevant important events, as you saw it, concerning the coronavirus response. But there is no reference to you telling the Prime Minister to call for an immediate lockdown on the 13th of March. And you know that there are no notes and no emails in the inquiry's possession, because we've given them to you, that records that conversation. So. I am required to ask you, how sure are you that you told the Prime Minister that he had to call for an immediate lockdown in a call on the 13th of March? I can remember it, and it, it, it came to light in looking forward to this uh, inquiry. And what's more, the corroborating evidence, if you like, is that it happened, is that on the, it is recorded, that on the 14th, which was the Saturday, uh, there was a, uh, significant discussions in uh, number 10 at which I made this case again. All right. Could we have 48313, page 5, please, on the screen? This is a WhatsApp message between you and Mr Cummings a bit earlier, Mr Hank, yeah. on the 23rd of January. M Evidence has been given to this inquiry by Mr Cummings that he WhatsApped you, as we can see there, to ask you to what extent have you investigated preparations for something terrible like Ebola or a flu pandemic. 
Yes, you say, we have full plans, yeah. plural, up to and including pandemic levels, regularly prepped and refreshed. Yeah. So just pausing there, that may give the impression that whatever plans they were and whatever, however deficient or effective they were, they had been recently, because of the word refreshed, prepped and brought up to date. Yeah. Very fairly, you accept in your book yeah. and, and in your statement that the only plan that there was was a strategy plan from 2011 in, in the field of central government response to a pandemic, not, not NHS surge capacity or beds, but the central government response to a pandemic. There was the 2011 strategy. Yeah. A single document based doctrinally on a completely inappropriate approach. Yeah. This is what I thought at the time. As but you but can who, see. Told, who told you that? Uh, Public Health England, um, the World Health Organization. Um, well, just, so just pause there. The World Health Organization yes. doesn't, of course, hold the book for the United Kingdom plans. No, but it has. It did analysis on which countries are the best prepared, and we were the second overall. So all I can tell you is what I thought at the time. It's not what I think now. We, you wouldn't, as the Secretary of State, phoned up the World Health Organization and said, what are our plans? You would have made inquiries in your department. Yes. When you made those inquiries, what plans are there? Yes. What information, what description of those plans were you given? Well, it was essentially the output of the Cygnus um, exercise, the, um, the fact that we had legislative plans um, available if necessary. We had both the um, legislative vehicle of the 1984 Public Health Act and we had the, um, the draft bill, which by then I will have known about, um, we had uh, plans to get uh, testing up and running uh, within PHE. Now, that obviously happened far too slowly thereafter. But remember, at this point, PHE had performed extremely well in the early couple of weeks of the pandemic by developing a test within three days of receiving the data from China. Um, we had, by then, in the department already discussed uh, the vaccine, and we knew that we had a vaccine platform that had been funded in order to respond to Ebola uh, that had the potential to be used in response to uh, this new uh, virus um, at Oxford University. Um, so uh, the, with hindsight, it would have been far better if I'd said, um, I do know about this, I really need your help, the plans that we've got aren't up to it. Um, but that wasn't what I... It wasn't what I thought, what I was being told at the time. You're the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. Yeah. The, the country is facing an unknown but extremely serious pathogenic outbreak on the 23rd of January. Nobody knows how far it's going to spread at that stage, but you, you plainly need to know what the plans are. My question was put to you to, to elicit what your understanding was from our staff and your advisors and your officials of the government's central infection control plans. Yes. Prosaically, do we shut schools? Yes. Do we quarantine people? Do we have hand washing? Mm -hmm. Do we self-isolate? If so, for how, how long and whether is it individually or is it for a household? Those sorts of issues. So not pandemic bill proposals. Why not? Well, I, I, it's important is, as well, then. Mr. Hancock, because that is not the question I've asked you. I want to know about what your understanding was of the state of play of the countermeasures. That's to say, the infection control measures, not not vaccine proposals or Cygnus reports, which didn't deal, of course, with countermeasures or legislative proposals, but but prosaically, how as a country are we going to stop? the virus from spreading if it comes? Um, uh, there's a number of things in your question I need to uh, correct. Um, Cygnus was uh, involved with legislative proposals. I, d I suggested uh, it wasn't involved with proposals for countermeasures. It didn't propose particular countermeasures in its recommendations. The, the Cygnus was, contrary to your initial question, uh, involved in legislative proposals. Furthermore, legislative proposals are countermeasures because you can't 
isolate people against their will without legislation. So uh, this attempt in the questioning to split off different parts of the overall response is false. That's, what I, that's why I'm responding in the way that I am to your, to your question. The premise of the question was wrong. Um, the reason that I held this confident view at that point is because, for instance, the Global Health Security Index in 2019 said that we were the second best country prepared in the world after the US and that we were the best in the world in the subcategory of rapid response to and mitigation of the spread of an epidemic. Um, the WHO said the UK remains amongst the leaders worldwide in preparing for a pandemic. This all turned out not to be true, but it is what I was being told at the time. All right. On the 6th of February 2020, there was a cabinet meeting, Mr Hancock, mm. 56137, page 6. Concluding, the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care said he was grateful for the support of his ministerial colleagues. There were two cases in the United Kingdom. They were, of course, as you've correctly identified, uh, on the 30th and 31st of January. And there would almost certainly be more. The approach to tackling the virus in the United Kingdom to date had been medic-led. The central point, according to these minutes, Mr Hancock, that you then make, is that the government had a plan to deal with this illness. Yes. You didn't, in fact, within the Department of Health and Social Care, commission until the 10th of February the plan, the battle plan, as you describe it in your statement, or the action plan, as it was published on the 3rd of March. And therefore, what plan was it that you were referring your cabinet colleagues to to deal with the illness? Well, firstly, we had the pandemic flu uh, strategy set out in 2011. But by this point, we had a whole series of different plans for expanding different areas. So we had a plan for the expansion of testing within PHE. Now, that plan did not go fast enough, and I had to, uh, take, the, I had to take serious action uh, to change that in the middle of March. Uh, we had a plan for the development of a vaccine, and we'd already put extra funds into the development of a vaccine uh, by this point. Um, we had a whole series of plans. I, in a number of questions, you've said there was an absence of a plan. That is not true. There was a plan. In fact, there was a plan with detail on a whole different series of areas. My critique of the plan is that it was not an adequate plan in doctrine or in level of detail, and it's absolutely incumbent on this inquiry to get to the substance of what the future plan should be. And it's that substance that really uh, matters. So we had a plan. It was guided by the science. Um, by this point, I was much more worried that on the 23rd of January, the, uh, and, and really it was over the, the last week of January that my... Um, my worry levels changed categorically um, because we saw the reasonable worst case scenario and I remember that meeting very vividly. That was at the end of January. You'll also notice in here that I said in the reasonable worst case scenario we'd see almost every government department affected. Well, that was an understatement. I shouldn't have said almost. Um, and that colleagues should attend personally or designate a junior minister who was dedicated to this task. Dedicated. Um, so I, I'm this is clearly me saying to the rest of my cabinet colleagues, um, we're all going to have to get stuck in on this. Um, and, um, and, and yes, we did have a plan. It, it, it is entirely reasonable for me to both explain that we had a plan, indeed plans in place, but also critique for the future where those plans were uh, flawed. One further question on this topic, please, Mr Hancock. On the 14th of February 2020, so a week or so later, we needn't put the document up, but at um, page seven of the Cabinet minutes, or the, the, the note of the meeting, again, your Cabinet colleagues are told the government had a plan yes. informed by science. Yes. Helen McNamara has given evidence to the effect, through her witness statement, that time and time again, Cabinet was assured that, quote, we had plans in place. You have described the vaccine preparation work. 
the, the, what was done, and we'll come to the detail of it in due course, what was done by way of testing, but so that we can clearly understand your response. Are you saying that there was, throughout February, already in place a plan for countermeasures, that is to say, infection control measures, the sorts of measures which were ultimately put into place on the 12th of March, the 16th of March, the 20th of March and the 23rd of March? I, I'm so sorry, we didn't put measures into place on the 12th of March. I don't 12th of March was to. the first day on which measures were put into place. You'll recall it was the order for symptomatic individuals to isolate for seven days. The, um, the measures that were put in place were much more stringent than had been envisaged in the original plan. Could you please just answer the question? Were there, as far as you understood it, on the advice of your advisers and your colleagues, plans for countermeasures, for infection control measures in existence and told, informed to the Cabinet in February 2020? There was a plan as set out and based on the 2011 pan flu, pandemic flu plan updated with the conclusions of Cygnus. And in Module 1, we discussed at length the flaws in that plan. Um, the argument there wasn't a plan is false. Indeed, uh, I've heard a number of Cabinet Office figures argue that there wasn't a plan. If you look at the 28th of February submission to the Prime Minister by uh, CCS, it sets out that we have very advanced plans. In fact, it is um, much too uh, bullish and self-confident, um, that note. And, uh, uh, and the idea that it was wrong to suggest that we had a plan is, is completely false. I appreciate that some people in the Cabinet Office did then later uh, catch up with the seriousness of the situation and become rather alarmed. I, I think that their reaction when they finally woke up um, in some cases was helpful because the machine ground into action. In some cases it was um, not particularly helpful because it would have been better if they'd said um, we now realise there's a problem, what have you been doing about it? As opposed to um, uh, as opposed to the, uh, the toxic blame culture that we've seen and referred to already. Melody, I'm coming to a completely different subject. Um, would you like to have a read then, or would you like me to trundle on? No. Uh, I shall return um, at 20 past.
Mr Hancock, the different issue, the new issue, is asymptomatic transmission. Is it possible to add one small coda to a, uh, an answer which I gave just before? By all Be means. Because you expressed, you were questioning me about my call to the Prime Minister on the 13th of March uh, and um, the fact that this wasn't in my book. Since I wrote that book, further evidence has come to light because I've been preparing for the inquiry. And if you look at INQ 00022628, you will, for instance, see an email from me to the Prime Minister on the 13th of March arguing for a suppression strategy and indeed making the case that we should make uh, the argument globally for a suppression strategy uh, because of the international exposure of the UK. So there is hard evidence that came to light since I wrote the book, uh, which explains why I've been able to expand further on this period in my testimony. Mr Hancock, the inquiry is well aware of that email. There is an email to the Prime Minister and there are a series of WhatsApps on the 13th and 14th of March in which you attempt to coral support for a global strategy of eradicating the virus. Yes. In that email on the 13th of March, to which you wish us to have regard, do you use the word immediate or lockdown? I, I don't have it in front of me. Do you use the word immediate or lockdown? I, I don't have it in front of me. All right. Asymptomatic transmission. The great importance of asymptomatic transmission is that until you know whether or not transmission is asymptomatic, you cannot work out from the number of people who are hospitalised and from the number of those persons who are hospitalised who may die what the full extent of the viral spread is. Because if you're asymptomatic, you may transmit the virus without showing symptoms, and therefore it's impossible to know, unless you mass test the whole population, who has got the virus. So you can't work out what proportion will be hospitalised, what proportion will die. You can't see the scale of the problem. And in your witness statement, you say, my single greatest regret is not pushing harder for asymptomatic transmission to be the baseline assumption you say global scientific consensus reflected in the global scientific advice from the World Health Organization until April 2020 was that there was no asymptomatic transmission. That's what you say in your statement, isn't it? Yes. yes. In your diaries, and we'll just very quickly, uh, in your book, yeah. page two, you say, and it's quite difficult to see the... Page 22, I think. Uh, no, it's, it's page two of our document, Mr. Hank. Oh, I see. We, we've transcribed the relevant extracts into a separate document. Yeah. PHE is adamant that a coronavirus can't be passed on and the tests don't work on people without symptoms. On pages two to three of this document, the 27th of January... I pushed him, that's Professor... Sir Chris Whitty, on my worries about asymptomatic transmission, he said that the global scientific consensus is still that this is unlikely, but is unlikely, unlikely enough. If you can get it, pass it on and show no symptoms, it will be impossible to manage. Yes. And on the 29th of January, page four of our document, you, you say, feeling like a, a broken record, you push PHE about asymptomatic transmission. Yes. And... It is correct to say that in your, in your book for the 3rd of April, you note the publication by the World Health Organization of a report dated the 2nd of April in, in, in which um, there is reference to uh, evidence of um, documented asymptomatic transmission. Isn't that a CDC note, not a WHO note? Uh, yes, in fact, there are both. But, mm -hmm. yes, your, your book may refer to the CDC, but the World Health Organization restated the position two days before on the 2nd of April, or a day before. So your regret appears to be that you were told, and, uh, and certainly did not 
understand, but because you weren't told, that there was likely to be, or there may have been, asymptomatic transmission at an early enough stage when it really, really mattered. Is, is that the number? Yes. All right. There was a meeting on the 27th of January. Yep. 106067, page one. where the chief medical officer says, the CMO commented that previously our best understanding was that the virus was unlikely to transmit whilst patients were asymptomatic, but this was, is unable to be definitive there is a lack of, still a lack of clarity over what the Chinese official position is. CMO would expect that very symptomatic persons would be more likely to transmit the virus. And then CMO was confident but could not guarantee that asymptomatic persons would be less contagious than heavily symptomatic persons. If you could just hold that paragraph in, in your mind, Mr. Hancock, and we'll look at a meeting the next day, the 28th of January, 233747, page 2, Second bullet point, CMO commented that today's data appears slightly less reassuring than yesterday's, but the positive is that there has been no sustained transmission out of China. CMO commented that we cannot fully understand whether the measures imposed by China have, any, have had any significant impact in delaying transmission. And I think if we scroll back out, there is then a reference to uh, Germany. In this long page, I'm unlikely to be able to find it. CMO commented that there's now credible evidence of asymptomatic transmission within Germany. Thank you very much. It's about a third of the way, a third to half of the way down the page. If we could just scroll in on that. CMO commented there's now credible evidence of asymptomatic transmission within Germany. PHE reiterated there is no test for asymptomatic patients, and this would not be possible without invasive tests. And I apologize again to you, Mr. Hancock, if you could just bear that document in mind. And then we'll look at uh, a SAGE meeting of the 4th of February, 51925, page 3, paragraph 19. Asymptomatic transmission cannot be ruled out, and transmission from mildly symptomatic individuals is likely. And, and I'm going to summarize the remainder of the material bar one. There's a nerve tag meeting on the 21st of February, 119469, page six. Page six, paragraph 3.4. The evidence suggests Edmunds Professor John Edmonds commented on this after the meeting, taking into account the issue of asymptomatic cases, where the evidence suggests that 40% of virologically confirmed cases are asymptomatic. And that is, of course, in the context of the virus at large, but in particular, its spread in Singapore, South Korea, and Japan. So that material, together, Mr. Hancock, with another SAGE meeting on the 4th of February, tends to suggest that what the issue was, was whether or not there was a significant level of transmissibility in persons who were asymptomatic, that is to say, showing no symptoms. Putting it another way, if they're not symptomatic, they're not showing symptoms, then their transmissibility, the degree of contagion or contagiousness, is likely to be lower. This material doesn't say in terms there is no asymptomatic transmission. It simply says it reflects the developing learning. It's not likely, but it becomes increasingly likely, and indeed, 
by the NERV Dive meeting the 21st of February, there is clear material, material to suggest there is asymptomatic <laughs> transmission. Yes. In relation to the virus and its application abroad. So what were you told yeah. about that degree of difference? Were you told there is no asymptomatic transmission, which is what you appear to have been told? Yeah. Or were you told it's very difficult to be sure, there, yeah. are, there are no certainties in this sphere, but it's possible and then likely to be asymptomatic transmission? And, of course, ultimately, as you know very well, a precautionary approach is applied we, we can't take the risk that there isn't. We better work on the premise that there is. Yes. So this I, was... I apologise for referring... No, it's an incredibly important subject. This is, was a deep frustration to me at the time. Um, and it is, as I said, my, my single greatest regret with hindsight was not um, pushing on this harder. Um, and ultimately not overruling the formal scientific advice that I was uh, receiving. So there's only one thing in your summary that I would um, uh, challenge, which is that the WHO statement of the 2nd of April that you referred to, in fact said, and I quote, no documented asymptomatic transmission. It was then on the 3rd of April that the CDC came forward with a survey which demonstrated to a point of scientific clarity um, that there was highly likely to be asymptomatic transmission. And it was that CDC document, and I remember it very clearly at the time, that was, um, that was instrumental in then changing the scientific evidence that underpinned the policy advice in the UK. So I was aware from very early on of the concerns that there may be asymptomatic transmission. Um, as, I, as you've noted, I raised the question on the 27th of January. I also discussed the question with Jens Spahn, my opposite number in Germany, to whom I was uh, close. Um, I asked the uh, Director General of the WHO about the evidence from China, um, and he described the Chinese reports, which I'd seen in newspapers but also came formally through a diptel, although I don't recall seeing the diptel at the time, he described those as a translation error, and I was uh, within the UK system. They were also described to me as a translation error. Um, so I was aware of this from January. I understood the implications of significant asymptomatic uh, transmission, and my recollection is I kept on pushing on this question um, in uh, uh, January and February, especially. Um, it became the settled international view that policy should be based on an assumption of the transmission mechanism of SARS-CoV-1, i.e. SARS, um, as it's commonly known, um, because there was not um, scientifically robust information to contradict that. And here is an example of where the scientific method, which I enormously respect, uh, comes into challenge in a period of enormous uh, change and uncertainty. Um, because the, the scientists, to be able to base policy on a different assumption, wanted concrete, scientifically credible evidence. And what I had was essentially anecdotal evidence. And it was only when the CDC had performed this formal study, which they published on the 3rd of April, that the scientific establishment um, switched position. It's understandable the scientists base their uh, advice on the scientific method, um, and so I, I, it is, a, it, it is a, a, a problem because there are other examples, without wishing to go on too long, there are other examples, like in the discovery of treatments and the ruling out of treatments, like hydroxychloroquine, where some, some, some countries moved policy ahead of a formal scientific conclusion and got it wrong, because the science, actually, if you waited for the scientific method to be applied, you got, in that case, the answer that hydroxychloroquine didn't make a difference. So the scientific method matters, but it delayed the formal scientific advice telling us that we should base policy on an assumption that there can be asymptomatic transmission. I'm sorry that's a long answer, but it's a very, very important subject. Indeed. My question was framed exclusively about your understanding. Yes. In your book, 
you repeatedly state you were told that the coronavirus can't be passed on by somebody without symptoms. Yes, and that the previous six coronaviruses known to infect humans did not transmit asymptomatically. In evidence today, you have acknowledged that there were concerns that there may be asymptomatic transmission. Yes, I had that. And if you just allow me. Sorry. And in your statement, you say it's your single greatest regret that you didn't push harder back against the notion, by implication, that you were told there was no asymptomatic transmission. Yes. The two cannot live together. Either you were told, and you didn't understand, to the contrary, you were told there is no asymptomatic transmission, or you were told of concerns that there may be asymptomatic transmission, and those concerns crystallized over time. Which is it? I, I have explained, and I'll try to do a better job of explaining. Well, no, if you, if there you is just, the, no, Mr. Hancock, please, if, if you would bear with us, which of those is the correct position? What the, was your understanding? It's one or the other. No, it isn't one or the other. That's what I was going to explain. OK, I, I will give you my evidence of what I knew at the time and felt at the time and understood at the time. In late January, I was, became aware of concerns that there may have been asymptomatic transmission from China, from Germany. I challenged the system on whether there was or not. What came back was that, yes, there was anecdotal evidence that there may have been asymptomatic uh, transmission, but that we should not base policy on that assumption. Instead, the reasonable, this is what was said to me, the reasonable assumption should be made that, that COVID transmits as SARS did. And if you read, for instance, the 2nd of April document on um, transmission advice and guidance for care homes, in it, PHE explicitly state that policy is based on an assumption that transmission of COVID follows the same transmission mechanism as SARS because there is not yet enough reliable evidence to update that, um, uh, that assumption. So that is why what you, uh, you think are two uh, incompatible statements are both true. We were worried about the anecdotal evidence. I was worried about it from January. And there was, there was some evidence of it, often caveated, often with unlikely uh, written by it. Um, but policy was based on an assumption that COVID transmitted the same way as SARS, i.e. no um, asymptomatic transmission. That was a source of frustration to me, but I couldn't get PHE to change it because it was a clinical scientific decision. And I was the Secretary of State. The frustration I had is that with hindsight, I should have simply said, that may be your scientific ev evidence and advice to me. However, we shall base policy on an assumption that there is asymptomatic transmission. Um, there would have been downsides to that assumption. Um, and there's reasons that we didn't do that. Um, but essentially, my hunch, which was that there is, I should have used that to overrule the science. But you can understand why I did that on a couple of occasions. Um, uh, and we can go through those if you like. Uh, for instance, the returners from Wuhan, which I required to be quarantined, when the scientific advice was don't quarantine them. But, but that is what explains the apparent um, incompatibility with the statements that you set out. And that is the, both the, the evidence at the time and, um, it's, and, and, and how I feel about it now. In any event, it was obvious, wasn't it, from the lockdown in Italy, in the 11 municipalities to which you refer in your statement on the 21st of February, yeah. and the data from the Diamond Princess outbreak, the cruise ship on which there were UK nationals, that there was actually very significant asymptomatic transmission. So would you agree that by, certainly by those dates, 22nd of February, the lockdown in Italy, and the Diamond Princess data of um, mid-February, that there was clear asymptomatic transmission? No. I would, uh, I would say that with hindsight, that is now obvious. At the time, there was a fog of uncertainty over this question, as is, as is clear in all of the documentation that you've cited. Your department 
received reports showing from the Diamond Princess outbreak that around 18% of the people infected on board that boat, and it was a closed environment, you'll recall, had showed no symptoms. It was, it was in the press. It's referred to in SAGE memoranda. It was obvious there was asymptomatic transmission. So why couldn't I get PHE to change the scientific advice to base the assumption of transmission on asymptomatic transmission as opposed to symptomatic transmission? You can, I, I, think, I hope you can understand how frustrating this was. The answer to that question, here I'm putting myself because I was, you know, I was the, I was in the pro. Let's worry about asymptomatic transmission camp. The frustration was that the, um, the, understandably, from their point of view, and here I'm putting myself in their shoes, the PHE scientists said we have not got concrete evidence. The WHO, second of April, no documented asymptomatic transmission. So the international scientific consensus was that there is no documented asymptomatic transmission. Therefore, policy was based on the assumption that COVID transmitted as SARS. I had, by this stage, a significant amount of anecdotal evidence. Um, and hence, I've, I've, I've gone over this and over this and over this in my mind. If I had just said the science is different, that would not have carried the system with me because I'm the, I'm the representative of the people, if you like, I'm the, as the Secretary of State. And the scientific advice was very clear to the contrary. What I could have done was said, I don't, you know, that may be the formal scientific advice. I am overruling it and saying, instead, we're going to assume asymptomatic transmission. That would have had risks on the other side of assuming um, spread where it may have been unlikely to happen. Um, and um, uh, but with hindsight, of course, I, I wish I'd done that. Hence, it is my single biggest regret. But C what I'm trying to do is explain. No, no, Mr. Hancock, it's perfectly understandable. You, you would wish to answer at length on this important issue. But 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 could I invite you just to, please to to stick to the question? Sure. Two two nine four three zero, page two is a um, a message between the the government's chief scientific advisor and the chief medical officer on the 24th of July, where Sir Patrick Vannon says, why are the Prime Minister and Matt Hancock saying we didn't know about asymptomatic transmission? Exactly. Chris Whitley, I have no idea. We didn't know how important they were, that is correct, but we were aware of the possibility. But it is correct we thought transmission was most likely after symptoms, like SARS not by March, I think we were pretty clear that we thought there was asymptomatic transmission. We'll have to put up with quite a bit of this, just as well the SAGE minutes of public domain. And that's a reference, Mr Hancock, to the material, which I've summarised for yes. you. Yes. Do you know who the, Unknown is? Yeah, uh, unknown, as I've said, is Sir Patrick Vance. OK. The first entry is Sir Patrick Vance. So w would you acknowledge that the Chief Medical Officer and the, the Chief Scientific Advisor um, are, are stating there that they, they did know and they told you and the Prime Minister about the significance of asymptomatic transmission and the degree of it. And they are confounded by, by the notion that um, you and the Prime Minister are now apparently saying you didn't know about it. We're not apparently saying anything. We are clearly stating the position that was put to us as the scientific uh, position based on the global international scientific position which was to base policy on an assumption of no asymptomatic transmission as set out by PHE. That is what is being um, referred to in uh, the first of these uh, messages. Um, and I, I assume this is a shorthand from um, uh, Patrick Vallance saying, um, why is PM and Matt Hancock saying we didn't know? What we were, say what we were saying was the error was that the scientific advice kept required or uh, um, formally advised that policy should be based on an assumption of no asymptomatic transmission. If, and, and the problem here in this exchange is demonstrated by the words pretty clear. We were pretty clear that we thought, right, if the government chief scientific advisor knew, as opposed to was pretty clear and thought, then that may have changed the UK scientific position. But he didn't know, 
as we've seen, there was huge uncertainty. I'm not blaming him at all for this. There was huge uncertainty on this question. And it is deeply frustrating uh, to me now, and it was deeply frustrating to me at the time, that being pretty clear was not good enough to change the scientific advice I was receiving on which to base policy. All right. In any event, your witness statement acknowledges that the importance of this debate is, is that if you don't know the extent of asymptomatic transmission, you, you can't get a handle on the extent of the virus and, and, and therefore what proportion of persons infected will die because you don't know how many people at the base level are, have got the infection who don't die. And you make the suggestion in your witness statement that what could have been done in light of what you say is the lack of knowledge about the extent of asymptomatic transmission, is apply a precautionary approach. Yes. That is to say, simply state as a matter of internal policy or approach, Yes. we don't know the extent of asymptomatic transmission. We may not know for some time. So why don't we just apply a careful precautionary approach, which yes. is assume that it is at a significant level? In, in fact, um, it turned out to be between 30 and 34 percent, but you could take any level 20, 25, 30 percent, and then decide upon the countermeasures that are necessary to be able to yes. meet that threat in terms of infection control. I apologize for, for, for the, the long preamble. It, the stage was reached, wasn't it, in early March? around about the 10th and the 11th, that um, regardless of the science on asymptomatic transmission, that, that was the correct approach. You, you simply had to plan on the basis that it was, regardless of how strong the science was. So did it matter, ultimately, given that you did apply a precautionary approach? This question did matter. Um, and um, it, is, it is not fair to say that the scientists knew uh, for sure about this by mid-March. It's just not, that's not how they, that's Mr. not Hancock, how it I've, was represented. I've not asked you about that. I've asked you, does it matter that there was a debate, regardless of whether you were told or not, about the degree of asymptomatic transmission, yes. if, sensibly, the point was reached at which you just had to plan on the basis that there was and decide what appropriate countermeasures could be promulgated and applied? But that isn't what happened. Well... Mr Cummings' evidence is to this inquiry that by the 11th of March, it was generally understood that a large percentage was being transmitted asymptomatically. And in any event, the planning material, the reasonable worst-case scenario approach, presumed that there would be a high degree of asymptomatic transmission. So did it matter? Well, not, that, that is not accurate, as much of... Uh, that particular witness's evidence is not accurate. That is not accurate in all areas. Um, and that's the problem. Um, I based... I, I, I took the precautionary principle, in some cases overruling the scientific advice on the precautionary side. Uh, I mentioned, for instance, when, the, when we brought people back from Wuhan in late January, early February... The scientific advice from PHE was that they did not need to, to uh, be quarantined, and I overruled that and said that they needed to be quarantined based on the precautionary principle. And this is, uh, uh, but then until the CDC evidence on the 3rd of April, there were decisions taken based on the PHE assumption of no asymptomatic transmission. Now, not all. Um, and in some, you know, in the case of lockdown, the asymptomatic or non-asymptomatic route of transmission wasn't really discussed. It was clear that the cases were going up and we needed to take action. Um, the route of transmission for that decision was a, a second order consideration, but it was a primary consideration in some other areas. And, um, and, and on those, the official advice remained as it was until, uh, uh, until the 3rd of April. Had you understood and had it been widely understood that there was significant asymptomatic transmission earlier, what measures might have been available and might have been considered to be applied? 
you, you expressed this as being your greatest single regret. Yes. What wasn't done on account of what you say was the information that you were not provided with? What practical countermeasures might have been available which were not appreciated because of this fallacy? Well, for instance, um, in the guidance to care homes on discharge from hospital... No, I've, I've asked you about countermeasures in the context of infection control in March. I'm not talking about discharge from hospital. I'm talking about what policies in terms of preventing the spread of the infection round the United Kingdom in response to which the government did, of course, impose measures on the 12th, the 16th, the 20th and 23rd of March, ultimately. Yeah. What measures might have been applied differently had this misunderstanding, to use a neutral expression, not arisen? Um, I don't think it would have made a difference to those specific decisions. I think it made a, decision, it made a difference in terms of how infection prevention and control was done within health and care settings. That's very clear. How much time, if you like, doctrinally was given to this debate as the government machine trundled on in February and March? Ironically, in this case, not enough. You know, if, 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 the, if the chief scientific advisor's um, view, as expressed later in, in July in that um, WhatsApp exchange with the chief medical officer, um, if, if there had been a successful engagement between his view then, as in we pretty much knew, and the PHE um, scientists who were making the recommendations for policy um, within uh, health and care settings, if there'd been better engagement there, for instance, then the scientific ad um, advice might, I don't know, we can't be sure, might have been different. If, for instance, the the evidence I've now seen, which I wasn't aware of at the time, amongst some of the most eminent scientists in the UK, like Professor Ferguson and Professor Edmonds and others, um, that they had a high, higher degree of confidence that there was asymptomatic transmission, if that had been successfully promulgated to the World Health Organization, then we may have had a difference in the advice coming from the WHO. So we needed actually more debate about why, this, not less. Why was that crucial information, if, uh, as you've described it, not promulgated to you? you? SAGE existed to provide the United Kingdom government with scientific advice. They were contributors to SAGE. They communicated regularly within and without SAGE with Professor Sir Chris Whitty, who, together with Sir Patrick Vallance, spoke to you and your officials on a on a daily basis. Yes. And well, we, why did you not know this? Um, I knew what they knew, and I read the SAGE minutes. And as you'll see, the SAGE minutes and the various other things that I did see at the time clearly state that there, there may be or th there is likely some or there are all sorts of formulations of in a fog of uncertainty um, that there, but it was all essentially unproven anecdote. Well, I, and, I, I, and, and, and you, can I pause you there, Mr. Hancock? You, you, you appear to give a suggestion that the information that you were given was itself contained within a fog of uncertainty. I've put to you the nerve tag meeting of the 21st of February stated the evidence suggests that 40% of virologically confirmed cases are asymptomatic. That's not much of a fog, is it? Uh, I didn't see that evidence. 119469, paragraph 3.4, page 6. This was the reference to John Edmonds on nerve tag. We looked at it about 10 minutes ago. Are you saying you didn't see it at the time? Nerve tag, no. Right. I saw sage minutes, not nerve tag minutes. All right. There was another related issue, and you've, you've referred to this in the context of the, the policy of discharging patients from hospital, and that's the testing for asymptomatic patients. Just, case, just before we say, just before, yes. to, to make sure, just to give one final point of evidence Please. on this contradistinction between what some of the scientists were saying and the scientific advice on which some of the policy was based, on the 24th of March, so later than these times we were discussing, PHE describes anecdotal cases of asymptomatic transmission, but concludes these, and I, now I quote, do not provide evidence for asymptomatic transmission. So that is the evidence that's being provided to me as conclusive. So I'm saying 
anecdotage and unconfirmed um, uh, uh, data about this. I'm, I, through this period, I'm constantly pushing, as I was from January, for a conclusive um, uh, uh, science. And, and PHE's advice to me is these do not provide evidence for asymptomatic transmission. So that is why there's an apparent distinction here, and, and it, it, is, um, it is frustrating this wasn't cleared up earlier. Is the nub of it that you, you appear to be suggesting now that you, you placed, understandably, it's a related agency, you placed greater weight upon what you have been told by PHE, perhaps formally, than the information which was being relayed both directly and indirectly, routed through nerve tag, SAGE, the CMO and the GCSA to central government? It's a very good question. Did I place greater weight on it? I'm not sure I saw it like that. I saw, a, um, I saw inconclusive evidence on the one, one hand and categoric uh, conclusions based on the scientific method, i.e. this is unproven, on the other. All right. and, I, and, and, we, and those only finally got resolved at the very start of April with the CDC evidence. On the 11th of March at a Cabinet meeting, 56132, yes. page 4, you said unless individuals were symptomatic, there was no point in being tested. Yeah. The test would not work. SAGE, and not nerve tag, but SAGE, the official advisory body for uh, scientific body for emergencies, which was the, the, the sole route of scientific advice for the government, had reported on the 28th of January, 61510, page 3, paragraph 8, specific tests should be ready by the end of the week with capacity to run four to 500 tests. Sensitivity of tests unclear, particularly in early phases of illness or when symptoms are mild. Currently, it would not be useful to test asymptomatic individuals as a negative test result could not be interpreted with certainty. Yeah. The point made by SAGE, and it's, it's apparent also from Sir Patrick Valence's diaries and, and from WhatsApps between the CMO and the GCSA, is that the scientific evidence was saying you can test for asymptomatic individuals. And of course, you knew very well that contact tracing for the first few hundred individuals for travelers and index cases requires testing of everybody, whether yeah. they're asymptomatic or not. Yeah. But that there were real problems with the certainty of the outcome. Correct. Because you couldn't be certain that the negative test result, if that's what, what it was, was accurate. Yes. But you told Cabinet yes. there is no point in being tested. The test would not work. Yes. There is a difference there, Mr Hancock. Yes. Why was there a difference? Well, being told that the test would not work is the advice that I received from uh, PHE uh, from January. As it happened, I, I said a moment ago I saw the SAGE minutes. I saw the SAGE minutes from uh, some time into the crisis. I did not see the very early SAGE minutes. Can I just pause you there? But you, of course, accept that... The, the, the Chief Medical Officer's evidence, which is that anything that was important from SAGE was relayed to you at the multitude of meetings which... Uh, yes, but, but not in terms of linguistic analysis, and that is what this uh, debate and discussion comes down to, and the misunderstanding that the Government tra Chief Scientific Advisor had, as in his, which came to the fore in his evidence on this point. Um, if I can just set out the, the position as I saw it. Um, uh, apropos this SAGE uh, conclusion, PHE um, uh, stated clearly that the tests could not work to identify that people are negative. Uh, and that happened in early January, that advice. And the reason it was important at the time, for policy reasons, was about testing at the border. There was, there was a debate about testing at the border. Uh, I said, why don't we test at the border? And PHE correctly said, if we test at the border, um, we will not get, we will not find people because um, the tests are unlikely to be sensitive, as it says here, uh, on people with um, who are asymptomatic. Um, and so 
I described tests will not work in the context of testing people who don't have symptoms in order to prove that they are negative of coronavirus. Of course, if a test has any sensitivity at all, then it may find some people um, who are asymptomatic who, uh, where contact tracing can be useful. In that context, um, tests can, um, can work but they cannot be described as working for the purpose of ruling that somebody is negative of coronavirus. All right. You accept that there was an important difference between, you described it as linguistic, but there is an important difference between being told that a test has concerns about the level of certainty and being told that a test, quote, to use your words, if the cabinet minutes are right, does not work. Yes, it How, does not work for what purpose? That's the key thing. How could, on this vital issue, because as you rec recognise, testing of asymptomatic patients became hugely vital to the discharge of patients from hospital yes. and to the spread of the, hit spread of the virus around the care sector, adult care sector? Yes. How, on this hugely important issue, could that distinction, that difference of understanding, have resulted? Well, let me um, explain. Actually, uh, don't, don't worry, Mr. Hancock. I, I, I'm not sure that this is a point worth pursuing, Mr. Keith. I think uh, Mr. Hancock's given his explanation, right. which is he doesn't accept the, the the meaning that he would attribute to his comments is is the meaning. I'll you I'll, I'll move on. Thank you. Now, we've been exploring, Mr. Hancock, some of the areas asymptomatic transmission, the, the testing, what, what was said about the DHSC and its response. Because, as you know very well, um, Mr Cummings, Sir Patrick Vallance in his diaries, uh, Helen McNamara, have made reference to you lying, to you getting overexcited and just saying stuff, that you say things which surprise people because they knew the evidence base wasn't there. Out of fairness to you, and because this is a vital issue that goes to how well the system of government was operating, you being, as you describe in your book, in the hot seat, how could to a significant extent, important government advisers and officials have concluded that the Secretary of State for Health in the more of this public health crisis, in the more of the beast, was a liar. Well, I was not. You will note that there's no evidence from anybody who I worked with in the department or the health system who supported that, uh, those false allegations. Um, and indeed, where there have been specifics attached to any of those allegations, I've gone through them, and I'd be very happy to answer questions on any of them. Um, and then in a couple of occasions, there were general sweeping allegations which had no evidence whatsoever. In one case, the witness said, I haven't got this in black and white. Well, of course not, because it wasn't true. And in another case, um, the witness said um, the, uh, the, the accountability and governance arrangements didn't pick this up. Well, they didn't because, again, the allegation wasn't true. What there was was a great deal of hard work on our side and a toxic culture that we had to work with, which seemed to want to find people to, uh, to blame rather than uh, spend all of their effort solving the problems and uh, it's you know maybe i yeah I, I as i've said before i drove the system hard sometimes the people i was trying to push into action didn't think the action was necessary um and that's already been uh, very clear um mr it, i didn't know about most of this at the time i knew that it was difficult getting through stuff through the center but nobody expressed any of these things to my face M mr cummings was not one of the people who against him it might be said that he was resisting the government machine being moved onwards because the evidence plainly shows that around about the 13th, 14th of March, yeah. it was one of the voices calling for more immediate action. But he says, in terms, not just that you lied, but that you were unfit for the job. And as you know, he and Mr Johnson debated that claim 
and there was a debate about you being sacked. I, the inquiry has, has no interest in the truth of the allegations. It is impossible for the inquiry to resolve them. But the fact that the Prime Minister, his Chief Advisor, the Deputy Cabinet Secretary, the Cabinet Secretary all questioned your candour and, in large part, fitness for the job is a vital issue to any examination of how well, how well the system responded. This, this is an extraordinary state of affairs. Well, um, the inquiry can, if it chooses, get to the bottom of each of the specific allegations because they are not true, and I'm very happy to write with an explanation of each and every one of them. Um, the, um, of course, uh, the impact of the uh, toxic culture that essentially was caused by the chief advisor, um, but that clearly you can now, I can now see, not that I knew at the time, others were, um, were brought into, that was uh, unhelpful. Um, on the other hand, in the heat of a crisis, people say things, uh, especially on WhatsApp, which is essentially conversational, uh, that they don't um, that, are, that you know that they may not may not be their full considered opinion. For instance, the cabinet secretary also described me as can do in a note to the prime minister. So, um, you know, it, I think there's a broader view. And also, I got on with him perfectly well through the whole thing. And um, uh, and, and 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 afterwards, and it's only because of this inquiry that I've seen the um, language that he was using uh, behind the scenes. So, you know, was this a problem? up to a point. Um, what is the lesson for the future? I think, unfortunately, the lesson for the future is systems need to be in place so that if there is a malign actor in, in number 10... Do you mean Mr Cummings? Well, in this case, that was the example, but there may be in the future. But if there are people whose um, behaviour is, uh, is unprofessional, the system needs to be able to work uh, despite that. That's why I think I place reliance on the COBRA system and why I tried to use the COBRA system. Um, and I think that, you know, that is the repository of emergency response, knowledge, understanding, experience within government. And it, it, it was the appropriate place to run this response until it became so big that it needed its own um, systems of decision making. And eventually, the COVID S and COVID O system was put in place, which was, which is what I'd recommend for the future in an all-engulfing crisis like this. Um, so, up to a point, it was a problem. Was it unpleasant? Yes, it was unpleasant for a whole load of my staff as well, who got, who was subject to this sort of abuse um, from the um, from the chief advisor. It went fur wider than I thought at the time, um, but my job was to lead the health and care system, the whole thing, 1.4 million people in the NHS, over 3 million in social care. And so I just got on with, with doing that to the best of my ability. Mr Hancock, can I interrupt? You said systems need to be in place, and then you spoke about COBRA and COVID-O, COVID-S, yes. that we know did come into place. Yeah. To, a, you, to a degree. To, right. So what are you suggesting should happen in the future if you have, as you described it, a malign influence? Well, whether or not you have a malign influence, unfortunately, the system needs to be there in case, yeah. irrespective of the personalities of the people yeah. who are involved. Um, the way I would recommend it is that when you have a small or medium-sized crisis, the lead government department model works. When a crisis becomes um, clearly cross-governmental, then you need either the CDL, and the CDL really should be also the deputy prime minister. You know, that, is, that is the role. It's how it's normally done. It's how it's done at the moment. Occasionally, the deputy prime minister is another secretary of state. Far better if CDL. And so you can escalate to a CDL to have a cross-government response, and then and that would also bring in more senior resource from other departments, um, and um, then you can escalate the Cobra system to the Prime Minister, and then the escalation above that is to put in place specific structures, cabinet subcommittees, um, for response to an all-engulfing crisis. We tried with the MIG process; um, that was. Uh, it, it helped, but it wasn't as good as the COVID S COVID O structure, which I think is a, I think is the best in class of all my decade in government um, in terms of how to run a uh, 
uh, a national level response. Thank you. I, I need to ask you about three ancillary issues related to the issue of the atmosphere and, and, and the operations of number 10, Mr Hancock. So we're not, we're not done with this subject yet, I'm afraid. Firstly, evidence has been given that Mr Cummings may have exercised an unhealthy degree of influence on the Prime Minister. You may or may not be aware that, that it is contested evidence. Some witnesses, or one witness has said he did, another witness directly after he yeah. said he, he didn't. Are you in a position to comment on that particular aspect, that is to say, whether or not a special advisor exercised too great an influence on the decision-making process? And I invite you, please, to stick to this rigid structural issue. In terms of the decision-making ability of the Prime Minister, was there too great an influence operated? At times, yes. Right. Um, and I'll be very specific about what I thought went wrong. Um, as the COBRA system was running, um, in, um, in February, uh, the Prime Minister's chief advisor decided to, that he didn't like the COBRA system. That is on the record. Um, and he decided instead to take all of the major daily decisions uh, into his office. Um, and he invited a, a subset of the people who needed to be there to these meetings he didn't invite any uh, ministers. He didn't regard ministers as a valuable contribution uh, to any decision-making, as far as I could see, in the crisis, uh, or indeed any other time. Um, and so that's the COBRA. He, he, took the, he took the decisions, attempted to take them from the COBRA process to a meeting that he ran daily at 8 a.m. He invited some of the right people, but not all of them. Um, he didn't check with me beforehand and clashed it directly with my... A daily meeting, which was frustrating, because we had, we would we had a daily meeting in the department to feed into the prime minister's meeting at 9:15. Um, the reason these meetings are important is because there is a proper government emergency response system, and it was actively circumvented. And in one of these early meetings, um, the chief advisor said, "Decisions don't need to go to the prime minister." Now that is inappropriate in a democracy. Um, and I, I saw it simply as a, essentially a, uh, a power grab, um, but it, 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 it definitely got in the way of, the, of organizing the response for a, the period it was in operation. It was then replaced with the MIG system, which was better. We'll come back to that later. So your position is it, and, I, and the inquiry asks you, because of course the inquiry asks Mr Cummings to what extent the view taken by him and others of your unfitness for the job was a matter of atmospherics or toxicity or yeah. whether or not it actually affected the, the running of the government machine mm. and led to deleterious consequences. Do you assess that generally Mr Cummings's role, by contrast, of itself had a significant impact on the smooth running or, or significant operation of the government machine? Yes, of course. Right. It, it is, it may be thought to be of, to be rather remarkable, Mr Hancock, that whilst you couldn't have been unaware of the, the damage, as you say, being done to the government machine by Mr Cummings, and he and others, and I emphasise You've referred to a malign influence, but it's not just Mr Cummings who questioned your fitness for the job. H how could, in the face of this unprecedented crisis, how could this position have been allowed to, to eventuate? It, if it was damaging the government's response to matters of life and death, it just couldn't have been allowed to continue, surely? Yes, it was deeply, deeply frustrating. Um, and, and on two levels, uh, we've, dis we've discussed the, the structural problem, which was um, essentially an advisor trying to take executive authority away from the prime minister um, for a period until the cabinet secretary stopped it and put in place the MIG process. But there was also an effectively a cultural problem, which is that um, there, was a, 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 there was a culture of fear inculcated by the behavior of this particular individual 
he did in the middle of this, in the middle of, Je of February, um, uh, effectively cause the resignation of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Previously, just when, before... When, you know, it's important. No, it's no, important no, because... No, 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 Mr Hancock, please forgive me. The determination of what's important is, is really for the questioner. If my lady believes that you're answering, I'm preventing you from raising something that's important, she will no doubt correct me. Yeah. The, the issue of the resignation of the Chancellor of the Exchequer doesn't appear to me to be of great moment in the context of the coronavirus response. It was. Let me explain why. Well, if, if you it wish to simply explain. Yeah. It was uh, in, in just two sentences. Please, shortly. It was because it inculcated a culture of fear, whereas what we needed was a culture where everybody was brought to the table and given their heads to do their level best in a once-in-a-generation crisis. The way to lead in a crisis like this is to give people the confidence to do what they think needs to happen, and it caused the opposite of that. May we, may her ladyship, presume from that answer that you would say the same in relation to the way in which Mark Sedwell, the Cabinet Secretary, was treated in May of 2020? Well, I wasn't involved in that, but um, it would be far better for the system to have been run in a positive, collaborative spirit uh, as we tried to run the health family. You know, that's not the word. There were tensions within the health system. There were always trade-offs and challenges. But we essentially had a collaborative system where everybody came together and did their level best in a positive spirit. And when something went wrong, we asked how to fix it. And it, it, you know, that is how you... It's the only way to lead very large organisations in a crisis. Indeed. Now, Ms. Hanko, can we come, come please, to the... Um to the chronology and your understanding of the crisis faced by the government. Now we've put many of the, 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 the structural and doctrinal um, pieces of this jigsaw into place. Um, in your statement, you say that uh, on the 9th of January, uh, you received, because you'd asked for, a full written briefing on, on the news reports that you've seen in the press you made inquiries about, uh, at that very early stage, exercise Cygnus. You attempted to find out what the basic position was in relation to the vaccines. You spoke to the CMO repeatedly. And I don't want to go into the detail of it, but you prepared, you asked for and received a full written briefing on the 9th of January. But you also say in your statement that you spoke to the Prime Minister in the voting lobby and yes. told him about the new disease. And you, in a later passage in your statement, say you called him directly on at least four occasions to try and impress upon him my concerns as to the potential impact from the virus. Do we take from that sentence in your statement that you had repeatedly tried to speak to him about it because you assessed that the seriousness of the position was not being made plain to him? He didn't get the seriousness of the position. No, in his conversations with me, he always um, uh, acknowledged the potential seriousness. And at that stage, his response was that, that I needed to uh, keep an eye on it and do what I thought was necessary. And, and by the way, I think that was an entirely appropriate response at that very, very early stage. After all, we have these, um, we have these potential pandemic threats all the time. There, were, there have been two in the last fortnight in the newspapers. Well, you, they're your words and on at least four occasions during January, and so we deduce from that that you didn't just mean in that first early week or ten days, you meant throughout January. Uh, no, I meant um, until around the middle of January. You know, the, right. the, the time, my, my view of this moved from being, you know, one of many uh, potential crises that are always on the radar of a health secretary to a full-scale uh, national concern uh, in the middle of January. And you'll know from the evidence that, uh, I think it was the 22nd of January from memory, that uh, uh, Chris Wormald m delegated all other responsibilities in the health department other than uh, what was then thought known as the coronavirus. Um, so we took it very seriously um, and, and made it an absolutely number one issue from the middle of January. Right. Mr Hanko, will you forgive me if I, if I just remind you, please, to keep your answers as concise as you feel you can? Okay. 
In your statement, you nevertheless assert that others appear to be astonished or, or disinterested, or you were astonished that some people were disinterested or less than interested, as you saw it, in, in the seriousness of, of the position as you saw it. Uh, is that a reference to people who mattered, that is to say people who were in a position to be able to move the government machine forward, or were they just people you happened to speak to? Uh, um, everybody. Um, everybody. Right, from, you know, if you think about it like this... Just, just please, Mr Hancock, w were they people who mattered at the senior levels of government, or were they people you spoke to in the course of your day-to-day -day duties? Both. All right. On the 13th of January, your statement describes how Nerve Tag gave advice to the effect that there was, and I, I paraphrase, very little point in screening. And your statement demonstrates how throughout January, but particularly following Chinese New Year, you, you were concerned about the relatively limited way in which the government was responding to the risk of infection through the borders, through the border, the references to handing out leaflets, asking passengers whether they were ill. And you say in broad terms that, that you sought, or at least wished to have debated, the yeah. issue of quarantine, travel ban, uh, uh, and that not enough in general terms was being done. Is that a fair summary? Yes. The inquiries had a great deal of evidence from the scientists as to the scientific and practical realities yes. of, of border controls. Is, is it fair to say that notwithstanding your concerns and your prodding of the border system, ultimately, relatively speaking, very little was done by way of stringent restrictions being placed on the border to stop infection control? I uh, stop infection. Yes. Right. And I, I accepted their advice. And then when the, in mid-February, the, the virus blew up first in Italy. That was proof point they were right, because Italy had put in place uh, more screening at the border. Um, and then they became the first place known to be widely in, in, in infected in Europe. And that uh, was confirmation, if you like, that the scientific advice had been right. Your statement also makes plain that you sought assurances as to what was in place in terms of the contact tracing programme, such as it was. Yes. And, and you, were, you became aware, as, as perhaps you would have known already as the Secretary of State, that there was a limited process of test trace, isolate, test trace, contact and isolate for high consequence infectious diseases, for travellers, for the first few hundred of cases. That was the, the overall system. Yes. How soon did you appreciate that that system, limited as it was, was never going to be able to cope with the unprecedented demands of a, of a, of a pandemic with an infection fatality rate of 1%? During February. During February. All right. Sir Chris Whitty has described to the inquiry that he, he had no illusions that the United Kingdom was well set up to meet the challenges of a major pandemic, in part because of the absence of a sophisticated TTI system. He knew the investment in health public health for the purposes of dealing with the pandemic was suboptimal, to use his words. Uh, and he knew that there were realistically few levers of power at the disposal of the government to be able to control the spread of an infection, short of the measures which ultimately came to be applied. When did you begin to appreciate that that was the reality? Uh, again, during February. During January, there was very high quality uh, science uh, undertaken. Uh, the scientific performance of PHE was superb, um, and the advice I got was reassuring um, that we were well placed. And it gradually became clear to me that this wasn't right. On uh, in your statement, you, you refer to how, in late January, and in spite of your contact with the Prime Minister, your team was still getting calls from Number Ten and being dragged into meetings about how you were going to deliver manifesto commitments. Yes. What was that about? Well, the Prime Minister had just won a thumping majority, and he his team understandably wanted to make sure that the manifesto was delivered 
in full over five years so that they could um, successfully run for re-election. Mr Hancock, you raised this in your own witness statement in the context of raising your concerns with the Prime Minister and then noting that your team was being sidelined or, or, or being diverted from dealing with the crisis because of the manifesto meetings. They're your words, not the inquiries. Yes. Did that matter? May we presume from the fact you've mentioned it that it mattered? Uh, yes, it would have been far better if that time had all been spent on the, on the gathering storm. All right. On the 23rd of January, you'll recall that uh, you gave a statement to Parliament. I refer to that because it is a matter of record and not by way of an implied or indirect breach of parliamentary privilege. Because on the same day, you say in your statement that the chief medical officer told you that there was a 50-50 chance yeah. that the Wuhan quarantine would not work. Yes. Did you deduce from that that if the quarantine in Wuhan did not work, there was no practical means by which the further escape of the virus could be prevented? Essentially, that is what yes. I was told. And that's why you were told by him also that there would be a global outbreak. Uh, uh, there was a 50-50 chance of a global outbreak, not a 100% chance. And that is also, I, th I thought that it was a day earlier than the 23rd, but um, I'm not exactly sure of when he first said it to me. But this is also why I wanted a COBRA to try to wake up Whitehall to this threat. You must have appreciated, Mr Hancock, having been told by the chief medical officer that there was a 50-50 chance that the quarantine wouldn't work. And if it didn't work the outbreak would be global, that yeah. the virus was coming. Yeah. That once the virus had spread beyond China, yes. which, of course, it did at the end of January and the very beginning of February. Indeed, it had started by that stage already, but it wasn't sustained. Yeah. That the virus was coming, yes. that there was no means of stopping it. it if, if, that 50, if we were in the wrong side of that 50-50, which it turned out that we were, yes, that's exactly why I tried to get the whole government system going, yes. So, so why did you and your department and the central government machine spend so many meetings, so much time in meetings in February, in March, there's a, there's, a, there's a meeting on the 2nd of March, there's a meeting with the Prime Minister on the 8th of March, one with the Chancellor Exchequer on the 8th of March, debating the probability, and it was expressed in terms of one in five, one in ten, one in two, of the reasonable worst case scenario eventuating. The reality was that once the virus had spread from China, it was game over. The virus would come. Why was so much time spent debating the, the relatively arid issue of what is the probability of the reasonable worst case scenario coming to pass? I don't recall being, in, being involved in that debate or wasting any time on it at all. On the contrary, in late January, I stated at and concluded, I think, at COBRA that the reasonable worst case scenario should be the planning assumption for the country. I have since discovered uh, through the paperwork for this inquiry that there was this wider debate about what were the chances of that. Now, there's two parts. First is, is it going to escape China? The second is, if it goes global, how bad will it be? Will we hit the reasonable worst case scenario or something more central. Um, I, I took the prior decision based on the precautionary principle at the start of this, I think it was on the 29th of January, um, that we should base our approach on the reasonable worst case scenario happening. Um, it took, as we've discussed earlier, it took time to get the rest of the system to believe that that was not an overreaction. Um, and um, as, as we've seen, that some people describing my position as mad. It was not mad. It was the correct precautionary principle at the time. And, of course, with hindsight, it, it was right. Um, 56226 is a COBRA meeting on the 29th of January, which, right. which you chaired. Um, and and just, just while we get to that point, can I just ask you to confirm what you referred to earlier, which is that you had... I think around the 22nd of January, called for a, for a cobra. Yeah. But um, Downing Street had um, put obstacles in your path. 
I just want to establish that by way of the chronology. That's a matter of fact. The yes. the uh, I also I'm, I, I'm asking. You I also say. requested that um, I make a statement to Parliament. That was also delayed um, because the Downing Street grid didn't include um, a pandemic. All right, but there was, of course, a Cobra meeting on the 24th of January, the first one that you chaired, and then there was a second one on the 29th. And this is yes. Um, at page uh, five, paragraph three. There were two scenarios to be considered, said the CMO. The first was that the spread was confined within China. The second was that the spread was not limited to China and there would be a pandemic-like scenario with the UK impacted. So Chris Whitty has acknowledged in evidence, Mr Hancock, that he was telling Cobra there that if the second scenario came to pass, which is that the spread is not limited to China, there would be a pandemic and by necessary implication it would hit yes the world yes and the uk would be one of the countries yes so what the inquiry wants to understand is to what extent was it ever thought by you or others well if it does leave china it doesn't really matter or it may not matter absolutely because there are practical measures which which may mean that it won't come to the united kingdom and if it does there is a means practically of stopping its spread. That wasn't my view at all. On the contrary, this COBRA meeting happened the day after we'd had the reasonable worst case scenario meeting in the department, which is the first time that I was really faced up to the fact that hundreds of thousands of people would die if there was a reasonable worst case scenario or could die. Um, and that's when I I said, where are we up to on the vaccine? Can we accelerate the vaccine? Can we get testing going, etc.? So we, by this point, the Department for Health was fully engaged. The Permanent Secretary was fully spending all of his time, and, the, and I was spending as much of my time as I could on, on, on this in case the second scenario, as it's called here, happened, in case there was a pandemic. If we then look at paragraph four, the CMO said the reasonable worst case scenario was similar to the reasonable worst case scenario for pandemic influenza, that there was a 10% likelihood of the reasonable worst case scenario happening, but this figure had not been agreed by SAGE. Can you explain to the inquiry why, if on the one hand, the CMO is saying to you, there's a 50-50 chance of it leaving, mm -hmm. and if it does leave China, to, to paraphrase, game over. Yeah. But on the other, there is this debate about the likelihood of the reasonable worst case scenario happening. Either it leaves or it doesn't. No. And if it leaves, game over. This figure, 10%, is a uh, combination of two different considerations. One, 50 50, will it leave China? The second, if it goes global, are we going to be on the central case, a less bad case, or the reasonable worst case? So, for instance, yep. in, in SARS, uh, SARS did leave um, and go global, but the impact on the UK was nowhere near the reasonable worst case. In fact, it was quite close to the, close to the reasonable best case scenario. Indeed. What, though, determined on the premise that it did leave China and it was here, how bad it would be? The, the, the infection fatality rate was the infection fatality rate. The transmissibility was the transmiss transmissibility. What would determine whether or not it was a 200,000 death pandemic, a 300,000 or a 500,000 death? What, what did it depend on, Mr Hancock? Well, the central um, uh, variables in that are the, the IFR, as you mentioned. Which was determined undoubtedly by the middle and late, well, certainly by the no, much later late of February. This. Much later yeah, than this. Yeah, so this is a much... This is much earlier than we knew the IFR. We didn't know the transmissibility rate. And then, of course, the third factor, the, it would be the government and society's response, which can affect the R rate. So we, we didn't have the variables, but we did know that there was a um, significant chance of a pandemic. So it's 50-50 percent chance of a global pandemic. And then within that, there was a range of potential different outcomes from essentially it just petering out like SARS did in the West all the way through to basically what happened, because what happened was essentially the reasonable worst-case scenario. Why then, once the variables had become clear, 
which a month which, later, yeah. Why then was the reasonable worst case scenario still being debated, which, which it appears to be in 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 early March, the sage minutes the fourth of March. There's a Cobra meeting on the on the um, on the ninth of March. The, the reasonable worst-case scenario debate appears to have rumbled on and on long after it became clear that the virus was coming and attention needed to be paid to taking practical measures to stop it. That's not my recollection. My recollection is that this COBRA meeting, if you go back down to the conclusions, we presume that the reasonable worst-case scenario uh, should be the... We, we decide that the reasonable worst-case scenario should be the planning assumption of the United Kingdom... Uh, and from that moment, um, at, certainly in the department and the areas I led, uh, that is the basis on which we operated. We assumed it would come, and we assumed that it would be terrible. Um, and, um, and unfortunately, that assumption turned out to be correct. On the grounds that, if it wasn't the reasonable worst-case scenario, that would be better. So prepare for the worst and, and, and hope for the best. And in the end, we prepared for the worst, and that's what happened. So Chris Whitty has observed that having a, a reasonable worst-case scenario system is of itself somewhat ludicrous because the reasonable worst-case scenario for a pandemic was predicated on it being unmitigated and therefore, as he described it, wholly improbable. So attention was paid to whether or not a wholly improbable, at, at the very least unlikely scenario, would ever happen. And then debate was then... A, debate have revolved around the probability of that wholly improbable event occurring? Not in my uh, recollection, and it certainly wasn't anything I put any effort or time into. Or so I, so uh, until you made that um, uh, uh, proposition, I didn't really know that there was a big debate about that, and I right. certainly wasn't involved in it. My view was, reasonable worst-case scenario is what we should plan for. Can we please all get on with it? All right. 4th of February, there was what's been described in the inquiry as a stock take meeting, 146558. Yeah. It's notable, Mr Hancock, because the CMO briefed the Prime Minister on the COVID-19 that day for the first time. Um, there's a reference to the Prime Minister meeting you, the CST and colleagues from the centre today, yeah. and, and the CMO had been there. There, and we can see from the second paragraph, there is a short update on coronavirus, but the majority of the letter is concerned with other DHSC and NHS matters. G given that this was the first time that the CMO had briefed the Prime Minister directly, and given the fact that the public health beasts in the jungle, yourself and the Prime Minister and others, were there, did, do you feel that sufficient attention was paid to the debate on coronavirus, bearing in mind what you've told us about your concerns about the dawning crisis? It would have been a far better use of time, with hindsight, to have concentrated entirely on the coronavirus crisis. Um, the, when a meeting is prepared for the Prime Minister, especially in normal times, as this was seen as normal times, and, of course, this was before there were any deaths in the UK, um, then um, they would prepare um, a huge amount of work on a particular subject to get something else even onto the agenda is a uh, it requires some a effort um, and, um, and 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 that's what that's what we did all right 6th of february there was a cabinet meeting yes which you attended 56137 we can see your name third down on the left hand side page 6 there's a reference to a tabletop exercise yeah is that the exercise that became we can see it five lines from the bottom. There would be a tabletop exercise the following week. Is that the exercise that came, exercise Nimbus? Correct. Um, just dealing very briefly with Nimbus, um, evidence has been received by the inquiry to the effect that Nimbus focused on the likely, the likely impact on the NHS. And it's obvious because one of the terrible things that you faced in the course of that exercise was having to address the possibility of, in the face of a pandemic, making triage decisions about life and death. So obviously health and public health in the NHS was an important issue. Was that an exercise which you assessed was, was useful in terms of its attendees or the learning that came out of it? It's, a, it's an exercise that was 
specifically designed to deal with the coronavirus. Yeah. Did it work? Um, it worked only in one sense. So the Nimbus minutes demonstrate this, INQ 00195891. And the Nimbus minutes do show that the NHS... Uh, asked the question of how to prioritise when there is insufficient NHS capacity. And there was a debate around that, um, as you can see in the minutes. And then I concluded that it should be for clinicians, not for ministers, to make a decision on this basis. And that's how we went on and proceeded. Um, that is, the, the minutes are really clear on that. And um, that is also my clear recommendation, um, my clear recollection. It but there was one really important lesson that came out of Nimbus, which was that there was no way we could allow the NHS to become overwhelmed. So the whole debate for however long it was, an hour and a half, I can't remember the exact length of the exercise, was all about how do we manage once we're in the peak, when we have all these deaths. And I, my clear, my only memory, my only sort of um, conclusion from it was we must not let this happen. Um, and, um, and, of course, the question of who decides should there need to be a prioritisation is a horrific one. Thankfully, we never needed that. My view was that it should be clinicians, and that's in the minutes. Um, and the, um, uh, but thankfully, um, as Sir Simon Stevens said, that situation never came to pass, because, partly because, coming out of Nimbus, my view was, well, we can't ever let ourselves get that way. You, you said it worked only in one sense. Do we take it from that that there were ways in which it didn't work? Were, were there opportunities lost there for, for learning, for perhaps the learning to be embedded into the machine? Yeah. Well, you should, what if were it had, they? If it had been based on the correct doctrine, which is that as soon as you know you're going to need to lock down, you lock down as early as possible, as we discussed in Module 1, um, then it... The exercise should have been, in my view, with hindsight, should have been um, when we were faced with a decision, do we lock down or not, are we going to lock down the country? And at what point, how much data do you need? Because, of course, these are all times of enormous uncertainty. How much data do you need before you make a decision? What are the thresholds for deciding to uh, lock down? When are we going to... Uh, when, what MPIs are we going to put in place and in what order? How do you do this save lives in the least damaging way? These are the questions we should have been addressing at Nimbus, not uh, are we going to find enough mortuary space and who should decide on the prioritisation of NHS treatment? Just to unpick some of that, please, Mr Hancock. So there was an obvious debate around an understanding of the likely impact on the NHS of this case scenario eventuating. Mm -hmm. They couldn't not have been given the debate about body bags and the sheer numbers. It was there. a sort of presumption at the start of the exercise. Indeed. If the people who attended, ministers, of officials and advisers, had no illusion but that a coronal virus pandemic, and we've debated, of course, the understanding as to when you realised game was over and it was coming and there was no effective way of stopping it. Having appreciated that these were the sorts of deaths that were going to eventuate, yes. why, why was there not consideration given, not just to the doctrinal point that you raise, which is what do we do about lockdowns, and if we have a lockdown, should we go early? Why was there not, in a more general sense, any debate or thinking about infection control countermeasures, home isolation, household isolation, uh, shutting schools, the, the, all the other measures which, in due course, were imposed? That debate is absent. It, well, why, entirely, why do you think that was? Uh, because the Nimbus exercise was put together on the basis of the 2011 pandemic flu strategy, which was based on the wrong doctrine that the government's job in a pandemic is to manage the consequences of a pandemic, not to stop it happening. And that is an absolutely fundamental if the, uh, learning that we must, as a country, embrace. If there's one thing that this inquiry learns, and I'm, I'm very, I, I think it's very good that the inquiry is proposing to do a report after modules one and two, 
because this central question of when do you lock down, what are the triggers, um, in what order should NPIs be brought in, um, how much data do you need? Because, of course, this is all done in a time of growing data. If you wait, you get more data. Um, and so you can make decisions with more confidence. What are the legal structures, what are the operational structures that we should have ready in peacetime so that we can then bring them up to speed quickly? For instance, having a testing system ready to go, having a vaccine um, contract ready, uh, having the domestic vaccine manufacturer, which in my view is critical national infrastructure and we should not rely on that happening uh, abroad. All of these questions are central to the, in my view, to the uh, inquiry, but they're also should have been at the centre of uh, Nimbus. But I'm not criticising the people who put Nimbus together. They were putting together an exercise that was based on the then plan, the 2011 pandemic flu plan. And, you ha and at this point, it was still 50-50 whether it would escape oh. China. Your point about learning lessons for the future and it needs no emphasis. Coming back to whether or not something went wrong functionally with the outcome of that exercise, this was an exercise which wisely was put into place to deal with a coronavirus pandemic, to deal with examination of the practical measures that might be required. In the teeth of a pathogenic outbreak, which, had, which was already taking place, and it was a coronaviral outbreak, yep. It was a ministerial and advisory tabletop exercise designed to try to address the very problem faced by the United Kingdom. And it fundamentally, fundamentally, there was a complete absence yeah. of any attempt to identify what sort of measures might be required and what the terrible thinking would have to be about whether they are implied. Yeah, the, the, the question simply wasn't asked. Right. Is that a... Yes, my lady. I shall return at quarter to two.
technical alignment planning meeting, there are references to the Chief Medical Officer and also to Sir Patrick Vallance to a reasonable worst case scenario. You can see there, thank you very much, under the reasonable worst case scenario, there is a reference to 50% proportion symptomatic. So that goes back to the point you made earlier about, well, regardless of our developing understanding, a wise and sensible approach is to apply, it on a precaution, apply a precautionary approach and just assume it's going to be a certain level. Um, could we just go back to the, to the first page, please? Um, Sir Patrick Valance, JVT, Keith Willett, Jenny Harris, and some other individuals dialed in. Can you recall, it, it may be you can't, it's too long ago, but do you recall whether or not uh, this <coughs> meeting was brought to your attention? I, I, can't, I can't recall it right. specifically being brought to my attention. That isn't to say it, 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 it wasn't, and it certainly would have informed the advice I was getting from many of those present. A day before, according to your statement, on the 13th of February, Mr Hancock, paragraph 191, we needn't put it up, you, you say that SAGE came to the view that China had failed to contain coronavirus. So in the context of this debate about the two scenarios, either they contain it or they don't and it becomes a worldwide pandemic, can you recall your reaction on being told on the 13th of February that China had failed to contain the virus? Uh, no, I don't recall being told that as early as that. But this is from your statement, uh, paragraph 191. Can we, can we I'll turn to it? Could we have, please, the, the statement on the screen? 191. It's paragraph 191. I'm afraid I don't have a, a page number, but perhaps somebody below me can assist. Yes. If you've got the page number there, Mr Hancock. I d uh, the page number is uh, 45. It, it says on 30th of February, Sage came to the view that China had fa failed to contain COVID-19. I don't recall when I was told that. Right. My next question. <laughs> that was a seminal moment. In, in the context of this debate, you were, you were told there's a 50-50 scenario. It's contained or it's not. And if it's not, then subject to sustained community transmission, it's game over. Being told formally, the government machine was informed formally on the 13th of February that China had failed. Would you acknowledge that that was a, a, a vital moment? Uh, it certainly should have been. Yeah. Yes. On the 14th of February, the next day, 56138, page 7, you were present at, um, at the Cabinet, of course. Page uh, 7, thank you. The government's chief medical officer said that if the virus became widespread, there were plans in place that could slow down its spread. So that would appear to be a reference to infection control as opposed to vaccination or antiviral or therapeutics and so on, Mr Hancock. Yes. Did you, what did you understand that reference to plans in place to be? And, and I should say, obviously, I'm asking you about these minutes yeah. We have no way of knowing how accurate they reflected the course of the actual debate. Well, I think we should expect them to be accurate in as much as they are summaries. Um, but I, I don't specifically know what the CMO was referring to. Nevertheless, at this point, um, we were um, starting to consider the sorts of um, NPI-type measures that were then later worked on by... Sage ahead of its paper on the 26th. Were you? Can you specifically recall the DHSE working on MPIs on the 14th of February? Um, discussing them at, at that point in the middle of um, February, I, that's my recollection. I don't know whether there's any 
uh, paperwork, but I remember thinking we're in the health department and the, there's a load of work on all sorts of things not to do with us. The first papers on this that came to ministers came from the Cabinet Office. In my Indeed. And, and they were, as you rightly say, I think it was the 24th, not the 26th of SAGE, but they're, they're debated at great length in SAGE um, in, around the time period that you've, in, you've indicated. Yeah. But just coming back to, to the position now, mid-February, and in the context of SAGE having appreciated that China had failed to control, contain C-19, Although there is a reference to plans in place in the context of infection control, the measures for infection control were not even debated at SAGE until the 24th or 26th of February. Yeah. The action plan, which you commissioned on the 10th of February, wasn't yeah. published on the 3rd of March. Yeah. And as far as we can tell, there were no plans for expressly except everything you say about vaccines and antivirals and all the other great work being done by the DHSE, there was nothing on infection control. Um, it would be wrong to task the DHSC with policies outside of its remit. I'm not asking you to take responsibility for it. I'm just saying you... Well, the, on, the cabinet, contrary, on the contrary, on, on the contrary, my recollection is that we did take responsibility for it. We did work that was out with our remit. And, and I think that it, I think it was um, uh, Secretary of State Gove who said too much was asked of the DHSC. I think that's a reasonable um, presumption because so it wasn't happening elsewhere. What plans for infection control were in existence at this cabinet date, the 14th of February, Mr Hancock? Um, the plans in place at this point were based, still based on the 2011 uh, strategy as updated by the work that had been done on the contain, delay, mitigate strategy. Doctrinally, the 2011 strategy was still maintaining its... It, it was yes. still having an influence. It, what in practice, what in hard copy or email were the plans for infection control yes. by the 14th of February? So... Um, they there they would have been um, uh, based again on that plan, but that plan was not focused on overall slowing the spread of the virus. No, thank you. As the Secretary of State for Health, you have to acknowledge, Mr. Hancock, that by the fourteenth of February there were still no plans for infection control in existence. There was a 2011 strategy report, you had to be fair to you, commissioned a battle plan, but nothing had been committed to paper, had it? Well, the early, the commission of an early work on that battle plan had, but um, if, the, if, your, if your point is, was enough going on, absolutely not. Thank um, you. To the degree that there was something going on, uh, it was clearly, there was clearly not enough. I can't speak to exactly what was there on paper without you bringing it to my attention. Well, I can't prove an absence, can I, Mr Hancock? You understand the question. The question was about whether there were plans for infection control in existence. On page six, to go back one page, the Prime Minister, in the context of the messaging so far, had said he believed it had struck the right balance between preparing the public for what might happen and not causing unnecessary alarm. Can you recall from your attendance at the meeting to what extent the Cabinet and the Prime Minister were still concerned about being accused of overreaction or of alarmism? Yes, sorry, that was... Which date? Sorry, for your answer, which date? It's the same meeting, 14th, 14th. of February. Thank you. Lady. Yes, that was, that was a live consideration uh, all the way through. In summing up, on page 8, the Prime Minister n noted that he was grateful to you and your department for your work, and in particular for getting the balance of communications right. There was potential for the virus to have a large impact on the United Kingdom's economy, and it was important to be ready for that. You don't appear to have said in terms to the, to the Prime Minister and, and to your cabinet colleagues, 
containment has been lost. China has given up or has lost the fight to contain coronavirus 19. We have no practical measures for control, infection control. There is no test and trace system capable of dealing with the problem. And there are still no plans in existence for providing any kind of practical support in terms of countermeasures. Why did you not say those things? That's not how I'd characterise the situation. The first thing is that I have, I'm not confident that by this Cabinet meeting um, I will have known that SAGE had concluded that containment was lost. Um, and in fact, I don't think that I um, was told that for a, uh, a number of days after. I'm not exact, as I said, I'm not exactly sure when I was told that. But um, this meeting was the morning after the minutes of SAGE coming to that conclusion. First thing. Secondly, at this point in the department and in PHE and the health service, we were working extremely hard to prepare for the pandemic. I'd commissioned the action plan and work was underway on that. We were attempting and pushing PHE to build the uh, testing system and all of the other things that we were directly responsible for. Um, the, uh, as I say, the, we weren't directly responsible for NPIs. Um, and that's, that's the focus of your questioning. Thank you. Can I just ask you to elaborate further on not being responsible for NPIs? Obviously, you are the Secretary of State for Health, yeah. such a girl, but you're also a Cabinet Minister. And if you just allow me, please, Mr Hancock, and, and subject to Cabinet collective responsibility, or also, of course, a, a major player at the highest level of government. To what extent is it permissible for a Secretary of State to say, on behalf of a department, particularly the department which is concerned with health in a public health crisis, the national countermeasures were not strictly within our yeah. purview, that they're a matter for cross-government, yeah. when obviously a great deal of time is spent in cross-governmental meetings. Yeah. You have thousands of calls, thousands of meetings, thousands of officials working round the clock yeah. between you all to get on top of this issue. Is that a sustainable position? Um, it, it is in, in as far as the point I made. And the point I'm making is that there was a huge amount of work going on on these things, including in the department. The wider point I'm making is that there was a limit to what we in the department could do, what it was reasonable to do. We, we frequently strayed outside the limit of what a health department ought to or normally uh, did. And so, there's a di so you're asking me for um, essentially a paper trail around this. Of course, in the national meetings, I should have, it was my role to um, push for these sorts of measures. The detail of who wrote what the measures should be was not a matter for me. That's the distinction I'm trying right. to make. Right. So which department of government carried the primary responsibility for thinking about, drawing up and debating the, implica uh, the application of countermeasures, infection control countermeasures? Um, infection control in the population as a whole, as opposed yes. to in her, her hospitals and care homes. National. Cabinet office. Cabinet office. COBRA, on the 18th of February, 56227, the, again, you chair this, um, this COBRA, Mr Hancock, it's, it's one of them, I think five or six COBRAs at that time that you, you chaired. Um, Sir Professor Sir Chris Whitty on page five, paragraph two, says, provides an update on the global risk, both escalation to a global pandemic and isolation of the majority of cases to China remained realistic possibilities. Now, mindful of what you said, that you, you don't know when you were told that SAGE had concluded that China had failed to contain um, coronavirus-19. This is now four days further on. Did anybody think, as far as you were able to tell, to think to stop and say, well, if, if, if China, China has lost control, um, 
to what extent can we be assured that it is only still a realistic possibility that the majority of cases will be confined to it? it, it, it there seems to be very little debate about this assumption. Uh, this final sentence that you've brought up here is my recollection of what I was being advised at the time and what I thought at the time. So when I was struggling to answer the question of when I was told the, the conclusion from Sage, this is closer to what I, this is what I remember at understanding at the time. Right. Yeah. Um, on the 18th... And you have to remember, in terms of process, apologies, Sage outcomes were reported to me by Professor Whitty. Did you not read the minutes? Later in the pandemic, I took the minutes directly. But at this early stage, I, the minute I was given a readout from Professor Whitty. Did anybody know that the Secretary of State for Health was not reading the minutes day in, day out from the sole Scientific Advisory Committee on Emergencies? Uh, I don't know. The evidence before this inquiry, Mr Hancock, is that the minutes were deliberately consensual, consensus-driven and, and short... They were, they were quite yeah. short, yeah. to enable them to be read by Cabinet Office, well, yeah. DHSC, um, Civil Contingency Secretariat, Number 10, and so on. But, but they, they weren't read by you? Uh, the, um, they, they, they certainly were when they were presented to me, and they were... Um, and, the came up and, and they were reported to me by the CMO, and this is my understanding of the situation at the time. Can I press you, please, to help us with when you first regularly started being presented with and reading... Uh, uh, I asked for them at some point in the middle of... Uh, at some point in February to be regularly put in my box alongside being... The, but the formal process was not that... I mean, we can, uh, we can come on to this because I've got quite a lot of thoughts about how this interaction operated, and it's very, very important. Um, with hindsight, I think I should have gone and listened directly to the debate in SAGE. I don't think that would have queered the pitch. Um, and, but the process of SAGE was that SAGE was a uh, committee that, remember, at this point did not have the sort of nationally known significance that it does now. Um, it was a group of scientists who uh, came together to make recommendations and bring the science to the uh, the CSO and the CMO. Regardless of their public prominence, Mr Hancock, the position is that SAGE was the sole body providing science on the characteristics of the virus, what it amounted to, what the threat was, what in theory could be done, and the minutes from that body, which were being produced on a tri-weekly basis, were not, you say, being put before the Secretary of State responsible for public health? Not in the first instance, until I asked for them. And, but, I, but also, uh, the premise of your question is not correct. They were not the sole and only body. There were, they had subcommittees like SPIM. There was NERVTAG, which reported formally into the department. And, of course, there was a much wider body of publicly debated scientific advice. So um, SAGE was an important body, but um, I think that it would be wrong to fetishise the uh, existence of, uh, and the role of SAGE. Was there another scientific body concerned with emergencies for the United Kingdom government? Uh, yes, NERVTAG, for instance, had no, a significant NERVTAG was a DHSC subcommittee which reported on new and emerging viral threats, an yes. advisory group reporting to DHSC. What other scientific emergency body provided advice to the United Kingdom government? Um, as I said, NERVTAG did to, uh, to me through JVT, which was, he was my rapporteur on NERVTAG, and then SAGE, of course, had a number of subcommittees. Right. On 18th of February, <coughs> your witness statement records, paragraph 194, that you were told by Public Health England that the country's approach to tracing all contacts was unsustainable. Yes. Did you know that on the day or by the time that you chaired the COBRA on the 18th of February? I don't know. On page 7 of COBRA, of those minutes, paragraph 17, the Civil Contingency Secretariat said there was work to be done to create a clear plan of activity 
across the United Kingdom government from the moment of sustained transmission to its estimated peak, which was likely to be a period of three months. When you heard those words, did you understand that the director of the Civil Contingency Secretary was referring to a clear plan of activity for control, infection control measures, i.e. to do with the subject matter of what came the 12th, 16th, 20th, 23rd March measures? No. What that did was... you take that to be a reference to then? The director of the Civil Contingency Secretariat um, was a strong supporter of the um, 2011 approach, if M I can call Mr. It. Hancock, please forgive me. She said there was work to be done to create a clear plan of activity. What did you understand as the chair of that committee that to be a reference to? Uh, just, just what is it? To, to the sort of um, uh, work that was, for instance, highlighted in the Nimbus exercise. Um, the activity proposed here is activity to prepare for a large-scale pandemic um, essentially unmitigated. But you yourself said Nimbus had no reference and made no reference to any countermeasures at all. That's right. So what was this a reference to then? If it, it was a reference, it was to, reference to all the other work that you would need if you didn't take any countermeasures. That was the view, that was the position of CCS as represented uh, and, be and, and, and articulated, for instance, in the 28th of February note from CCS to the Prime Minister, which was all an, a note about how to manage um, the consequences of a pandemic, not how to, uh, how to stop it. All right. To get our bearings, Mr Hancock, um, there was half term um, between Friday the 14th of February and Monday the 24th of February, by and large. During that half term, Italy imposed a lockdown on 11 municipalities. Reports were prepared on the significance of the Diamond Princess coronaviral outbreak, and although you have given evidence to the effect that it may not have been drawn to your attention. Nerve tag happened to have reported during that time, the 21st of February, that 40% of virologically confirmed cases were asymptomatic. Can you assist the inquiry, please, with what, if any, work was done on countermeasures for infection control between the COBRA of the 18th of February and I've just shown you the reference to the CCS, and the 28th of February, which is when a, a, a paper, as it happens, was prepared by them. Do you know whether any work was done other than in relation to that paper? Uh, yes, there was work, there was scientific work being done by SAGE on the consideration of NPIs. Um, there was a note that was um, put together by SAGE, which is dated the 26th of February that was considered at the 27th of February meeting by you SAGE. You referred to that earlier. Yeah. Do you know whether or not pen was put to paper in any way by government to set out even a broad outline of what practical infection control measures might be required to be implemented? Yes, the department was drafting what became the action plan. Now, there's a genesis of that plan. We started, I, I commissioned a... Can, can I... Forgive me, I'm okay. going to come to the plan in a moment. Okay, and I'll but at, at this point it was being drafted, so yes. Right, so, so the plan which was published on the 3rd of March was being drafted. Worked, yes. worked and on. SAGE was doing scientific work, yeah. But there was no draft anywhere being circulated amongst relevant bodies between COBRA on the 18th and the 28th of February when they reported setting out possible countermeasures. Um, the work was being done on the action plan. That was the work going on in the department. And there was work being done within the SAGE structure, which came to the 26th of um, uh, February paper. And furthermore, there was work being done by lawyers on the legal framework needed. Hmm. The, uh, pandemic, uh, uh, the pandemic and, bill, the coronavirus bill became the act, all that. And the measures that were needed under the Public Health Act 1984 in order to have um, uh, legal recourse for... Uh, um, mandated hmm. quarantine. Legislative proposals are not non-pharmaceutical interventions. Yes, they are. All right. Well, 
Well, they, as a matter of fact, they are. Um, and it's very important that I correct you on that point, because if the inquiry comes to the wrong conclusion on that, it's a, it will be a mistake. Um, communications are very important uh, non-pharmaceutical intervention. Uh, legislation is a very important non-pharmaceutical intervention, because if you want to have, for instance, a stay-at-home measure, you can't have it uh, in a mandatory sense without legislation. So uh, I'm emphatic on that point, because you've made that mistake twice. Mr Keyes, I think we're going round in circles. I think we were here this morning. On the 28th of February, a view was expressed by a Prime Minister uh, when this CCS report was debated that the biggest damage may be done by overreaction. Yes. What was your response? Uh, I, I don't recall being told that that was his view of the paper. On the 28th of February, your statement records, however, that your belief that Number 10 was stopping the Prime Minister from saying publicly anything about the virus. Yes. So the 27th and, of... Sorry. And you knew that that was because there was a concern that it would be seen to be overreacting. Yeah. The 28th of February was an important day in the uh, response, and uh, it was important in this way. I had a readout from the SAGE on the 27th, which both take, took the paper on NPIs that we've just been talking about and also discussed the 1% IFR figure. The 1% IFR figure is very important because if you have a 1% fatality rate um, at an 80% of the population getting it, you end up with a reasonable worst-case scenario of just over half a million people dying. And I found that out on the evening of the 27th, if I recall correctly. On the 28th, um, I was still not being allowed to communicate in the way I'd want on this, uh, not able to go on certain radio shows, including the Today programme, which is a very important part of the national debate. And I phoned up the Prime Minister, and I remember it very well, because he, um, uh, he didn't take the call, and then he called me back, and I was in a classroom in a primary school in Suffolk, in Haverhill, in my constituency. And I had to say to the kids, I'm really sorry the Prime Minister's calling, I've got to go. And it, it was quite a moment. I came out and I said, Prime Minister, you need to chair a COBRA and we need to be able to communicate properly, including on all of the programmes, instead of having this political boycott. Um, and I, th that led to, I, I, that, I wanted a COBRA that day, uh, and I told him he should chair a COBRA immediately. <laughs> In the end, we had the COBRA on the Monday, which I think was the 2nd of March. Over that weekend, I, um, uh, I went out and communicated uh, in public about all the things that we might have to do. We might have to close some schools. Uh, we might have to shut down whole cities. I don't rule anything out, I said. Um, and that all flowed from uh, this uh, phone call on the morning of the 28th of February. And I regard that as the moment that the centre of government, led by the Prime Minister, really started to uh, come into action. And if I may say so, with hindsight, Italy having locked down initially locally in Lombardy on the 21st of January, and then nationally locked down around also the 28th of February, if at that moment, having seen the SAGE um, assumptions, which they didn't properly fully adopt, but nevertheless, and you've heard from the scientists on that, if that, at that moment, we'd realised that it was definitely coming and the reasonable worst case scenario was as awful as it was, that is the moment that we should, with hindsight, have acted. And we, we, if we'd had the doctrine that I propose, which is as soon as you know you've got a lockdown, you lock down as soon as possible, then we would have got the lockdown done over that weekend, in on the 2nd of March, three weeks earlier than before. There's a doubling rate at this point estimated every three to four days. We would have been six doublings ahead of where we were, which means that fewer than a tenth of the number of people would have died in the first wave. At the time, there was still enormous uncertainty. The number of cases was still very low. In fact, there were only 12 cases reported on the 1st of March. So you can understand why, and, and the costs of what I'm just proposing were known and huge. So I can, I, I, I defend the actions that were taken by the government at the time, knowing what we did. But with hindsight, 
That's the moment we should have done it three weeks earlier, and it would have it would have saved many, many lives. Monday, the 2nd of March. That is, with hindsight, having obviously thought about this um, and reflected on this a huge deal over the last uh, few years, with hindsight, the moment we should have been able, the moment we first moment we realistically could have really cracked it was on the, um, on, on the 2nd of March, three weeks earlier than we did. Mr Hancock, you have been heard loud and clear. At that meeting on COBRA, the 2nd of March, it, the chief medical officer said that interventions to delay the spread of the virus must not be implemented too early. Yes. It is clear from COBRA minutes of, from the 4th of March, your witness statement, paragraph 236, to the effect that there was a real debate about whether the public might comply. Yep. Your witness statement to 269, which is that you were asked by people outside government why the government was not introducing restrictions sooner, and you responded by saying you'd received clinical advice to the effect the government, quote, should not go too soon. And you also refer to how your sense was that the wider world was moving faster than the official advice was being received. For how long did this notion that in terms of the application of countermeasures, the country should not go too early, which transmorphed itself into a debate on behavioural fatigue in Correct. due course. How long and to what extent do you assess that that debate slowed down the reaction so that we found ourselves in a position which you've eloquently described, which is not going as early as you now, with hindsight, assess we should have done? Uh, for two weeks. And you can trace it very clearly. If you take the 28th of February as the moment when it became clear that action was going to be needed um, and the work put, was put together over that weekend, the COBRA on the 2nd uh, in the end, um, the um, action plan finally published on the 3rd. As it happens on the 1st, it was a Sunday, I spoke um, in, uh, on the MAR programme, and when asked, will you lock down whole cities, I said, I can't rule it, we can't rule anything out. Um, incidentally, to show where society was up to and the broader debate, when I said, you've got to, you don't want to go too early, you know, the response was, well, yes, we all know, we all think that. So it, it, this is not just a government thing, this is a whole of society question. Um, and there was, a, there was then, from that period, that weekend, um, the discussion was then when to go, not whether to go. So it switched from where, whether to go to when to go. And we held fire because we, because we didn't know how long the public would put up with measures for, and that was the clear uh, scientific advice. And on this, Patrick Valance and Chris Whitty were completely united. I don't recall any distinction between their views during this period. And then on the 13th of March, um, we effectively um, came to a different view. Um, I, I've had the chance to check because you questioned my, the phone call I made to the Prime Minister. It was at 3.34 um, that afternoon. I've been at 3.24. I've been able to check my phone records, which have, um, I've, have come to light since. Um, just, just hold on. Just, on no, 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 Mr Hancock. You know perfectly well that we have scoured every possible source for documents and material relevant to the issues in this inquiry. Are you saying that you have a record of a phone call which you've not disclosed to this inquiry? Uh, no, there isn't. There's only a record that the phone call took place. So you don't know what you said in that phone call? I do. All right. Proceed. Um, so that's on the 13th. Evening of the 13th, I send the email that we discussed earlier. On the 14th, we're in Downing Street, and we have a series of meetings, uh, including uh, some in the cabinet room and some in the smaller office. Um, and then on the 15th, had the formal meeting at which 
we decided to uh, Please take action. Please come back to the issue, which is the issue I asked you about, which was the concern that going too early would yes. limit effectiveness. The CMO, and, and, and we must be clear about this, of course there was a whole society anxiety, to use your phrase, whole society, concern about should we be contemplating yes. the intolerable? Yeah. Should the country countenance these extraordinary unprecedented measures? With enormous costs. With enormous costs. I've asked you about a notion which is expressly referred to in the COBRA meeting the 2nd of March, which yes. was that interventions to delay the spread of the virus must not be implemented too early in order to ensure maximum effectiveness. Yes. So put aside the whole society anxiety. Yes. Your witness statement says you relayed to a particular former Prime Minister who asked you why weren't we going too early, yes. that you had been told on <clears throat> clinical advice, yes. that's your word, yes. clinical advice, that we should not implement countermeasures yet. Yes. So what was the basis? Well, you, you've said it came from the CMO and the GCSA. Yes. This clinical notion. Yes. You're saying that lasted for two weeks? Correct. All right. And do you assess, therefore, that that was a major contributory feature to the government not acting earlier? With hindsight, yes. At the time, it was entirely understandable. All right. The action plan, and yes. we can deal with this, please, briefly. Yeah. Because you've referred to it in uh, in a number of ways. The yeah. action plan was dated the 3rd of March. There it is. Thank you. Would you please just accept, for, for the purposes of speed, that it was a, a document prepared across the United Kingdom? We can see references to the DA's involvement there on the yes. page. We know that it was commissioned by you, according to the evidence of... Sir Christopher Wormald, on the um, 10th of February, you requested in an email to Kevin Dodds that the work be commenced. It was developed under the leadership, according to Sir Christopher Wormald, of the DHSC, and, and this was the document that was drafted from around about the 10th of February to the 3rd of March. Yes. Did the government, did the DHSC, did, did you or Sir Christopher Wormald, ponder the wisdom of commissioning a report on the 10th of February that by the time it had done the rounds of government and been redrafted and re-edited and so on and so forth, was not published until the 3rd of March, by which time, as, as you've accepted, containment for all in practical and tense purposes had been lost. Well, I initially uh, commissioned it as a health action plan. I wanted to set out in public what the department needed to do um, sometimes when you're trying to drive action in government, publishing something is one of the quickest ways of doing it, because once it's published, everybody falls behind it, and then you don't have any arguments about what uh, the plan should be. And, that's, and so publication is sometimes um, most important for the purposes of driving action within government. This has been uh, criticised as being high level and more of a comms plan. Um, more accurately, I would say, of course, it was uh, about explaining to the public what might come next, and, I, and we did a huge amount of uh, explaining off the back of it, but it was also about telling the department, and then in the end it ended up as a cross-government document um, and a cross-UK document about what we might have to do. You say quite reasonably that when you're trying to drive action in government, publishing something is one of the quickest ways of doing it. Sometimes. Quite. On this occasion, in the face of a fast-moving pandemic, it, it took 21 days from the commissioning to the publication. So it wasn't terribly quick. Well, in the, in the grand scheme of government documents, that's unbelievably fast. Uh, they normally take months. Um, the civil service team who worked on this were absolutely brilliant inside the DHSC. It was then slowed down when I, it, it was sent for clearance, and I think there's been some discussion of that. Um, and that was deeply frustrating. But it was very, very important to get out, to drive action internally, and also to start to 
um, explain to the public the sorts of absolutely extraordinary things that might have to happen. It was the first time we communicated to the public that we might have to shut schools, close down whole cities, and um, ask people to um, isolate at home. These are huge, unprecedented interventions, and it was very important to start to communicate that to the public. I've not suggested that there wasn't merit in the document. I've asked you about the delay in its publication. I wish it had come out quicker. Um, at page four, without going to it, the, the, the document claims that the United Kingdom is well prepared. At page 10, in the context of the, the overarching strategy, you'll recall, Mr. Hancock, contain, delay, mitigate. You, more than anybody, will remember those words, of course. The, the, the document significantly overpitched the reality. We weren't well prepared, and in so far as the strategy envisaged future loss of containment, and if control is lost, then we'll move to delay. Well, when it was this was already over. Absolutely. When this was commissioned, um, it, that was the, um, uh, the clear strategy. Um, and, it, and that strategy remained formally in place until the um, 12th, uh, 12th 13th, 14th, exactly. 12th of March, indeed, containment was officially departed from. Can Mr. I ask you about. I've just, forgive me interrupting. I've just had another look at the action plan. Um, there's quite a lot of information in there. What I can't find is too much of the action points. No, there's not nearly as much as I wish that there had been. There are, they, act, they are in there, they're buried at the end, and it was enough to allow the media to then report it as we wished, which was these are the sorts of things that might have to happen. So closure of schools, for instance, it, it, these are me they're mentioned, but they're not up front nearly as much as they not, should have been. You would say... I'd say better than nothing. Uh, I was going to say, you would say better than nothing, and I suspect you'd also say, remember that at the time this was commissioned, the DHSC expressly understood, and you've said yourself, that it had its doctrinal genesis in the flu in, plan. In 2011. And, and that's why there was a reference to closing schools, which is very much part of a flu plan, but no reference to the sorts of terrible countermeasures which we ultimately had to consider? Well, th there are oblique references, but um, it was not as... Obviously, if I went back and rewrote it now, it would be completely different. No. Mr Hangot, forgive us, though. I asked you, basically, what, what the worth of it was. You, you've accepted that there are only, on, in your words, oblique references to the sort of countermeasures which ultimately came to pass. Yeah. Schools is different, because yeah. that's based on the, the genesis of the 2011 strategy. Your officials and others worked for weeks on it, for three weeks. Yes. It, it was informative and, and perhaps revelatory to some. Yes. But as the government's sole strategy document, it, it had significant flaws. Um, it was, when it was commissioned, we were still on the strategy, which I uh, have... Um, Explain. It's, I've, I've been pretty clear that I am not a fan of the strategy with, that we went, the doctrine that we went into this pandemic. So why with, did you sign off on it? Uh, because that was our thinking at the time, and by the time it had then been delayed and stuck in the cabinet office, um, it was better to have it out and driving action than not. Than nothing. All. Yes. All right. Can I ask you briefly, please, about two other relevant events around this time? Did you? Have, uh, did you call, in fact, the World Health Organization um, about the need for a declaration of a pandemic on the 2nd of March? It wasn't, in fact, announced till the 11th of March. Yeah. Had you also spoken to the World Health Organization earlier about their declaration, which you, as you saw it, was delayed yes. because the PHEIC wasn't, in fact, announced until the 30th of January? notwithstanding an earlier committee debate at the WHO. Correct. Right. I mean, I, I pushed and pushed and pushed on the WHO on both of those declarations. Well, I want you to... I want that to be acknowledged. I mean, I, I, what, what I haven't been able to find is a record of the 22nd of January call, which I remember, which is when I was told we can't have a P hit because somebody's on a plane, and it was a ridiculous um, excuse. And I thought that there might be some politics. It's not worth... You know, well, which is outside the remit of this. Maybe you'll find that call in that little notebook that you've just produced. It's not a notebook. It was a phone record. All right. The 2nd of March, and another vital point... 
you, you uh, the Minister for Care was Helen Waitley, was she not? Yes. At that time. You refer at paragraph 230 of your statement to how, uh, at this time, the 2nd of March, your department and she made inquiries about the state of planning in the care sector. Yes. And was there a, a revelatory moment in relation to the state of planning, not countermeasure planning, yeah. but the planning broadly in the care sector? Yes. And what was that? So our early position had been according essentially the constitutional position, which is that um, care homes are legally responsible to, contracted by um, local authorities. And therefore, they reported action through local resilience to local authorities, through local resilience fora, up to MHCLG. And the department is responsible for social care with respect to policy, but not to any of the legal contracting or indeed the reporting. Um, that was the position going into the pandemic. It was a, it, it is a, it is anachronistic and it has needed reform for a long, long uh, time and those reforms have been delayed. That was the position going in. Helen Waitley then, um, in very, in early March, um, came to the very firm view that not enough was happening. Um, in February, we had had discussions with the uh, care sector, we'd had round tables, um, but the policy position going in was that local authorities are responsible and um, uh, and it turned out that it was something else that we as a department had to had to grip. Thank you for the description of the functional the background. What you refer in paragraph 232, however, is that in terms of the planning, there is obviously an obligation on the sector, Mr Hancock, to produce plans for itself. Oh, yes. Regardless of the financing, regardless yes. of the funding and so on and so forth. She appreciated and you, she messaged you. Yes. She'd only been provided with two existing pandemic contingency plans in the whole of the care sector. Yes. And that's what she told you. Yes, that's correct. All right. So I'm aware the LGA have said, no, there were more around. Um, that may, I don't know the facts of this. What I do know is what I was told, and I was told I'd asked to see them, and there were only two, and they were inadequate. All right. On the 12th of March, Sage was presented with some slides, 56209. At page two, There is a reference in the first bullet point. Note, SAGE advised that interventions one to four should each deliver benefits by delaying and flattening the peak and or lowering overall deaths. If you just retain that thought, please, Mr. Hancock, which is the 12th of March, and we'll look at the COBRA minutes itself for the 12th of March, 56221, page five. It's a COBRA chaired by the Prime Minister. At page five, paragraph two, you were there. The chair invited the GCSA to outline the objectives of implementing the interven interventions. And you've, you've explained how, of course, by this stage, there is now debate about the nature of the infection control interventions. The GCSA said that the aim was not to completely suppress the spread of the disease. Not only was this not possible, but it would likely lead to a larger second peak later in the year. So my question to you is this, is you've helpfully described that the reasonable worst case scenario debate didn't slow things down. The debate on what became behavioral fatigue did slow things down. To what extent did the debate about if you mitigate and you flatten a wave, uh, sorry, if you suppress completely the wave and you go for an um, eradication policy or suppression policy, it may bounce back like an uncoiled spring, I've mixed my metaphors, mm. later in the year. Mm. To what extent, if at all, did that concern or debate also 
ensure or, or lead to a, a slowing down of, of, of practical action being taken? Um, hardly at all, because this argument by the Chief Scientific Advisor that um, we should aim to, uh, with a good outcome of herd immunity by September 2020, this, this strategy uh, or this um, ob objective uh, was rapidly overtaken by the uh, decision on the uh, formally taken, I think, on the, either the 15th or the 16th, um, to ask people to end all unnecessary social contact. Absolutely. That's the end of it. Yeah. Well, that was the suppression strategy in full force by then. Yes. When, when did the debate about flattening versus suppression um, Over that uncoiled weekend. spring yeah. first find its way into the WhatsApps, into the meetings, into SAGE, into COBRA and so on? It happened very rapidly on the 13th, 14th and 15th of March. Well, um, I've put to you uh, material from the 12th of March. Um, there was a debate at COBRA 8 on the 9th of March about delaying a peak. But that was all like, about what is the right time for the intervention. So that was a debate about the, the point you mentioned earlier about um, yes. the efficacy of intervention rather than uncalled spring, if I can call it that. Uh, I, I don't know really what you mean by uncalled spring. but what well, I... there's, there's concern that if you completely suppress the virus, yeah. as soon as you lift the restrictions, it yeah. will uncoil and come back with greater vengeance. Later. As set out here. As the, um, I mean, short of a, without a vaccine, of course, that is a risk. Of course. Um, and um, it was, that was discussed, but it was very, very brief, the point. The, the time in which that was the main concern um, was very brief. All right. Now, whether one calls it a change in strategy or a dawning realisation or an acceleration. Yeah. On that Friday, or perhaps the Thursday, the 12th of March, Friday the 13th, and the <coughs> weekend of the 14th and 15th, the government took what may be considered to be a, 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 a very significant change of direction. Yes. The inquiry has received evidence that there was a body of scientific material built up by that stage from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Yeah. Professor Edmonds, Professor Ferguson at ICL, yeah. um, also at SAGE. Um, there were papers from, in particular, ICL. There were papers from Professor Riley. Professor Ferguson had emailed Ben Warner on the 10th of March. SAGE on the 10th of March had been asked by Neil <laughs> Ferguson, or rather the officials at SAGE had been asked by Neil Ferguson, do they know what an epidemic with 4,000 deaths a day looks like? And there were, according to your witness statement, there was much more data available by that weekend on the likely impact on the NHS. Yes. Could you just assist with the contribution from the DHC in terms, in terms of that acceleration? It looks as if Mr Cummings and some of his uh, associates and colleagues and the scientists and the NHS were providing the stimulus, the spur to this acceleration. What was coming from the DHSC in terms of trying to change the position of the government? Um, and that is an entirely opening to question. Maybe you'll say you were the one who was pushing or Sir Christopher Wormold was pushing. Can you assist us? Um, the, the clinical advice coming from the department was coming from Chris Whitty. Um, my contribution in this period was that on the um, um, the twelfth, I uh, I decided at this point that we needed we were going to have to have a UK wide response, and of course health is a devolved matter, um, and we can come back um, if you want to whether or not that's a good idea with a contagious disease as opposed to a health service. Um, so I went I went to um, Edinburgh and then uh, Belfast and. Um, uh, and Cardiff and discussed with my uh, opposite numbers in the uh, DAs um, and then I had a G7 call which I actually took in the health department in Cardiff and that had a very very significant impact on me because I heard directly from my Italian opposite number um, and we thought the Italians had acted early 
but he was saying he wished he'd act early, acted earlier still. And this argument that you should delay and uh, to time it right, he, he had no truck with. Um, and um, so that had a very significant impact on me. Um, and that was the point at which I started actively agitating uh, for a um, for very firm action for, an, for a lockdown. Uh, I spoke to the Prime Minister. I emailed him that evening. We've been through this a couple of times. Um, so essentially what happened was that over the period for the first two weeks of uh, March until then, um, we continued to work on all of the all of the health-specific things that are necessary, uh, the NHS response. Um, it was at that time um, we were working on, uh, we got the Nightingale Hospitals programme. If I may get acute health measures, perhaps. The measures directly within the health and social care department's remit. Yep. The question of lockdowns by then was correctly located within the Cabinet Office as the lead department on it. This had all happened since, which effectively was kicked off on the 2nd of March, Cobra, when the Prime Minister took the chair. Um, and um, so my, t my time in that period was essentially focused on what are we going to need in the health and social care um, area, um, given that this is clearly coming. On Saturday the 14th of March, and I'm not, I'm not going to take you sure. through what, what you know to be the, the number of meetings which you attended. Yeah. Um, that there were a number of crisis meetings attended by various people. Yeah. But um, you, you contributed to a, a WhatsApp group debate together with the chief scientific advisor, the chief medical officer, the prime minister, and Mr. Cummings, um, pithily called the CSA CMO Matt PM Dom group, 48399, page three. On the 14th, on the Saturday at 7.30, uh, 7.30.49, it may be over the page. Yes, there we are. Thank you. There is a debate. Commenced by, by Mr. Cummings, I think we should. I think we need to move fast on social distancing, work from home, oldies shouldn't go to weddings, closing pubs, nightclubs, and so on and so forth. And then there's a debate, Mr. Hancock, just to refresh your memory about how the public need to be informed as to the nature of the crisis and what needs to be done. Yeah. And and Chris Whitty agrees, and and you say this. We also need urgently to address the WHO criticisms of our approach. Yes. We need to ramp up testing, not stop testing. Yes. Just bearing in mind, of course, community testing had stopped on the 12th of March. Yeah. You had, and it's made, it's obvious from the paperwork, you'd openly recognised the alarming news that there was no sophisticated test and trace system beyond the first few hundred. And then you say we need to continue contact tracing and introduce self-contact tracing. Yeah. Both of these are in hand. Yeah. What did you mean by both of these are in hand? Um, <clears throat> on the 12th of um, March, it, it had been announced that we were going to stop community testing and stop uh, contact tracing. Um, I was, um, I don't want to overplay it because I didn't actively stop it, but I was sceptical of whether we should stop these things. I'd been trying to drive up uh, testing, trying to get PHE to engage the private sector in testing. Um, and I basically, at this point, had the um, confidence to say what I previously thought, uh, urged on by the WHO, which was, what on earth are we doing stopping these things? We need to, um, <clears throat> we need to keep driving. Point. But the testing in the community had stopped. There was no contact tracing thereafter in the community. There was well, not no, until I got it going again. Quite. There was no self-contact tracing. Why did you say both of these are in hand? Because by then I'd issued the instruction internally that we should not accept that these have to stop. Now, on so just, could, could just pause there. Could you please help the inquiry with what those instructions were and uh, when I, they were? I, I don't know the detail of them. But what I, rem what I remember is, firstly, that the, the, the approaches were different on testing and on contact tracing. Indeed. On testing, 
The problem at this point was that we didn't have enough tests for community testing. And you'll, you'll know that the action that I took, both of these are in hand, the action I took with David Halpin and Will War, who was at number 10, um, was that we arranged a meeting on the 17th of March um, to uh, try to electrify the growth of, the, of testing. And at that meeting, I took the responsibility for testing from PHE back into the department and drove it very hard from there. And I'm happy to answer any questions on that. Forgive me, um, Mr. Hancock. You said you'll know that the action I took. What? You said you'll know that the action that I took, et cetera, et cetera, and therefore on that this is on hand. I, well, we, we, I, Sorry, I, I must put out. to you, I don't give evidence. I've never given evidence in these proceedings. But you cannot say you, the inquiry, will know that. Uh, the inquiry does not know that you took any of those steps or that both of these are in hand. I, I apologise. Um, I should have said, um, as I set out in my written statement, um, I took the responsibility from testing from PHE into the department and we set up uh, the uh, four pillars that became five pillars that became the 100,000 target test, testing target that became test and trace. Um, the second thing is on contact tracing. We'd stopped, uh, PHE had stopped contact tracing, um, and the uh, action that we took uh, after this was to restart contact tracing and do it at large scale using a scale model of how to deliver it rather than a specialist model, if I put it that way and also introduced self-contact tracing, which became the app. Um, so that is what I mean by both of these are in hand. It's shorthand for an, in absolute, two absolutely enormous programs that uh, came from this. That all started by the 14th of March. It, 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 I, I kicked it off after. What happened was I basically was uncomfortable with these, de these decisions that were made by, uh, that were advised, and I, but I accepted them. So I accept responsibility. Uh, but I was uncomfortable with them. The WHO criticised us for them, and I listened very carefully to that WHO criticism and uh, essentially reversed the decisions. Uh, the, the, I think what the point Mr Keith is getting at is, were these all in hand by the 14th of March, accepting all that you said? Well, by in hand, what I mean is we're getting on with making them happen. Right. We didn't have a big testing programme. These things take months to build rather than... Um, being immediate, but um, I was the reason I put both of these in hand. I didn't want to say this is a decision that I'm asking you, O oh, Prime Minister, to opine on. I'm just saying I have got on with this. I'll move on to the next point. The lockdown decision. You, you have um, candidly and and openly already acknowledged today that, with hindsight we should have locked down much earlier. And you've given a helpful indication as to when that might have been possible. Um, I just would like, please, to, to take you to paragraph 23 of your witness statement, where you set out in broad terms that view. Uh, it's page six of the, the major statement. But, but I think it's important that, that absolutely on the record of your statement, we, we, we can see how you've put it. With hindsight and information we did not have at the time, it's now obvious that we should have locked down much earlier. I say that with hindsight. It was not at all clear at the time. The scientific caution over looking down, or locking down was based on uncertainty over how the public would respond and poor data. And you explain how new evidence came to light. And of course, SAGE says we're further along the epidemiological trajectory than it had understood, and so on and so forth. The discussion was centred on the timing of the lockdown because of strong advice, for example, from independent say, scientific pandemic insights groups by B, that people would likely only put up with lockdown for a short period of time. That advice, you say, clearly turned out to be wrong. Can I press you, please, then, for clarity? Are you saying that the only reason that we did not lock down earlier was because of that advice from Spy B, along with the data problem, which you identify earlier in the paragraph, but which advice you say clearly turned out to be wrong. 
At this time, information was still sparse. The first death in the UK had happened on the 1st <coughs> of March, and the uh, case numbers were still, compared to what came later, uh, very, uh, very low. Um, and so you have to understand these decisions in the context of um, the, what we did know and a lot of what we didn't know. So that's why this, I have a different view with hindsight to compared to uh, what happened uh, at the time. I, I think it is the case that the concern over timing the lockdown correctly was the main reason why um, it wasn't put in place sooner. Um, but it's also true that SAGE um, changed its advice in terms of where we were on the epidemiological curve because of new the, the data, data that came to light. All right. um, and um, uh, they thought previously we were around four weeks, um, quotes, behind Italy, which was the metric that we were that we were using. Now, with hindsight, it didn't matter whether we were behind Italy two weeks or four weeks. We should have been, as soon as you know you've got to lock down, you've got to lock down. Uh, but that was the, this was the data that came to light. And in fact, David Halpern put it rather, he reminded me of a phone conversation I had with him when he was the first person to report on this, the key SAGE meeting to me. Um, I later had a formal readout from the CMO, as I always did, but um, I heard from Halpern, and I remember being relieved because my the anecdotal data I was getting out of the NHS and others was that we were this was this was going up the reasonable worst case scenario curve, um, and then I it was formally came to us through Sage that that's what was happening, and the irony was that 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 to me didn't feel like new information. It felt like com formal confirmation of what I had a. I'd, I'd been picking up from the um, from from analysing the data myself. Two points, please, Mr. Hancock. You, you referred to Sage, of course, saying, "Well, we're, we're we're not as far behind Italy as we understood we were." Yeah. If I may suggest, it must be right to say it just didn't matter because nothing that you and the DHSC or nothing in the cabinet office was doing, nothing that Sage and nerve tag and all the other various parts of government was doing had been throughout February and early March predicated on what is Italy doing? Italy Correct. was doing what Italy was doing. So there can be no suggestion that, that, that any failure, if there is a failure, and if Milady finds there's a failure to impose the lockdown earlier, what, what was because of a, a, a misjudged reliance upon where Italy was in the epidemiological trajectory. No, no, on the contrary. Well, yeah. On the contrary, if I may explain. Um, in, if, in, just if you just accept that proposition, we're, we are, we're in agreement. The United Kingdom government wasn't planning its response between January, February, March and the 14th of March on what is Italy doing. It, it, it was, was just for a, a feature. Of, if, I, if I can explain, if you think that what ma the, the, the timing, if you think you've only got a limited lo period lockdown that you can put in place, the timing of that lockdown matters... And watching the Italian curve was the best way of thinking what would happen here. And so the Italy data were important in that sense. And then you had to judge, compared to where we were on Italy, where to bring in the lockdown. And indeed, we brought in the lockdown earlier in the epidemiological curve than Italy and others uh, did. My point is not about whether or not it's right to base yourself off Italy. My point is the whole doctrine of waiting, sort of allowing it to come towards you and hold, hold, and now we go, that was wrong. Instead, yes. the moment you need a lockdown, you need to lock down. Indeed. I, I was making a point for the absence of, of any confusion or doubt that, that there was no doctrinal approach taken by the United Kingdom government necessarily predicated on the Italian approach. No, of course it was that Italy was an example. Indeed. Yeah. The second point is this, is that the clinical advice, as you describe it in your own statement, to the effect that going early would limit effectiveness. Yeah. That is obviously and plainly an issue relevant to a lockdown decision, a mandatory stay-at-home order, stay order, because that is... Just wait. That is obviously the ultimate decision. It's It's a stay-at-home backed by force of law. 
to what extent does that behavioural fatigue notion explain or, or mitigate either delays in the system of operation of government, if that's what my lady finds it there to have been, or in the promulgation of plans, or in any failure just to say how it was, control is lost, the wave is coming, we must practically act now. Where do we put the behavioural fatigue fallacy into the general picture? It had an impact on the decision both to recommend actions to the, uh, to the public, which is an NPI, because communications are an NPI, and the mandatory uh, decisions that came thereafter, notably the closure of schools and then the full legal uh, lockdown on the 23rd. Um, I, the period, I see the period from the 16th to the 23rd as essentially a, um, a, a ratcheting up of lockdown. We went for a non-mandatory lockdown, followed by closure of schools, followed by mandatory lockdown. The same behavioural fatigue argument applied to all three. They are just different levels of NPI. Right. And, and now, but perhaps before a break, I want to ask you about the rationale um, for the lockdown. It, it is vital, Mr Hancock, and the inquiry has done this in relation to a number of witnesses at great length, to examine the rationale both for and against the imposition of the, the lockdown decision of the 23rd of March, on the premise it was the right decision, but also on the contrary position that it was the wrong decision. So you've already explained how your position is it was the right decision and indeed should have been done with hindsight considerably earlier. I want to just briefly look at the, the counter-argument. Yeah. It is obvious from the evidence in COBRA, the evidence um, before the Prime Minister, and in particular the COBRA meeting of Friday the 20th of March, chaired by Michael Gove, that material was being placed before the relevant bodies to suggest, firstly, if we don't proceed to the final ultimate mandatory backed by law stay-at-home order, there will be many more deaths than there would otherwise be. And secondly, that the impact, impact upon the NHS if those further final steps are not taken will be devastating. The paperwork shows that on the Monday, the 23rd of March, there was a great deal of debate about non-compliance during the previous weekend, attendance at parks and so on and so forth. There is, by contrast, very little debate on the face of the minutes from the 23rd of March of the data relating to the likely impact on the NHS and also on how many more deaths will be incurred if those steps aren't taken. Do you follow? And I, as the Secretary of State, yeah. I want to ask you, how clear were you that the data showing the terrible consequences of not acting how robust was it? How clearly was the position set out? Well, by the 23rd of March, the trajectory of those data was unknowable <coughs> because the trajectory on the 16th was knowable, predicted, and the reasonable worst-case scenario was happening. Um, the, of course, we took very significant action on the 16th. Um, the stay-at-home um, uh, request, if I put it that way, um, undoubtedly changed people's behaviour and therefore will have reduced R. Indeed. Because of the two-week lag from a change in the, the, the behaviour of the public to a change in the measured case rate, we had no idea by how much it had reduced R. However, we took the view on the 20th that we needed to close schools. Previously, we'd been hoping to get to Easter and then... Easter school holidays and then consider whether they reopen after the Easter school holidays. But by the 20th, we decided um, this was continuing to go up the reasonable worst case scenario. We need to pull that lever too. And then by the 21st, 
it, 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 essentially, the data from, that we considered on the 16th with the, da the data going up the reasonable worst case scenario continued up the reasonable worst case scenario. These are cases where people had caught it a couple of weeks earlier. So we had a greater confidence that we were on the reasonable worst case scenario, which is a terrible confidence to have, and therefore decided to go the full measure so it, and, and do, pull every lever available to us. Um, and, the, um, uh, and, and that was the consideration. So by the 23rd, there, was, there wasn't a new forecast of what would happen under the measures that were extant at that point because it would be two weeks before we knew the actual impact on the 16th, it is entirely reasonable to argue that the measures on the 16th themselves would have got R below 1, but it is entirely unknowable whether that argument is true or not. I think it's false. Um, the, and therefore, so I hope this is making sense, because it's about, it's about how we, essentially, it got, it got worse and worse along the lines of the reasonable worst-case scenario and my objective at that point was to get as many levers pulled as hard as possible to stop the NHS from being overwhelmed. And the NHS being overwhelmed is incredibly important because as soon as you run out of hospital capacity, the IFR itself goes up and you get more deaths from non-COVID-related uh, uh, health problems um, and because people can't get treatment. So the, 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 the point of overwhelming hospitals is not just because there's a moral duty to treat everybody. It's because the, the number of deaths gets materially worse uh, because essentially the, uh, uh, the, the people die because they don't get treatment. And, and that's what we needed to stop at that point, and therefore we pulled everything. I've asked you about the data. The inquiry well understands the, 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 the risks of direct and indirect sure. mortality. Y you've said... On the 16th of March, very significant action was taken. Those are your words. Mm -hmm. And, of course, additional action was taken on the 20th, mm -hmm. the closure of schools ordained by COBRA on the 18th. The, the point is this, Mr Hancock. On the premise, which must be a reasonable premise, that the measures imposed on the 16th and 20th of March were designed to work and were imposed because the government thought this will bring R below 1%. Why was more time not allowed the following week for those sensible measures, which in good faith the government had imposed, to see whether or not R would come down as far as would be necessary to prevent the collapse of the NHS, which might happen on an exponential growth curve at some indeterminate point in the future? There wasn't data before anybody saying, and your answer may be, it's impossible to provide a clear answer because you're dealing in the you're dealing with the context of an exponential growth curve. Correct. But there doesn't appear to be any debate about just <coughs> bluntly. We've done all this the previous week. The previous week's measures are very dramatic. Yeah. It was on the twentieth of March, a, an order that all non-essential retail and travel and everything be but everything was shut by word by advice. <laughs> Yeah. Schools were shut. The next step on the Monday was producing or, or backing it with the force of law. Why did nobody say, just hold on? We don't have to do this. We've only just done these prior measures three days before. We are entitled to conclude that the R rate is being reduced. There is a high level of compliance, but not as high as we would like and not as high as the data would suggest is required. Let's see whether or not our measures work, at least for a few more days, yeah. in, order, in order to pause and assess your very own steps yes. before the ultimate, yes. the, the most divisive, politically divisive and, and unprecedented step is taken. Um, gosh, there's so many questions in what you've but just there were. put. Um, the first thing is, it wasn't actually politically divisive. No, it's, it's become... Uh, yeah, I apologise. I'm not hi, suggesting it was so, then. It's, it is now. Well, so, you know, there is a... Um, 
Uh, some people forget what actually happened, but it wasn't divisive at all. There was enormous consensual support across a very large swathe of the population and almost all uh, political uh, uh, leaders. And in fact, the fact it happened in all four nations, uh, with led by five political parties, not even four political parties, at the same time, demonstrates that. Anyway, I set that to one side. I think on the data, the reasons are twofold. Um, the first is to do with the, what I said before, the exponential growth was happening. Um, uh, you know, thankfully, as a, as a trained economist, I'm used to dealing with exponential curves and understanding of the stats and maths behind them. Um, we, were, we had greater and greater confidence that we were on the reasonable worst case scenario path and that would lead to over half a million deaths happening. The problem with those forecasts was that they were coming true. Um, and people have criticised the forecast, and of course the forecast didn't happen because we took action. Um, and so that's the first thing, increased confidence that the worst was happening. The second thing um, is that at the same time, we did have an assessment of the sorts of levels of reduction of human interaction that would be needed to get R below 1. Because if R is at 3, to get it below 1, you need to reduce by two-thirds human interactions as a rule of thumb level, and we were not seeing that level of reduction. I think the SAGE papers said that they were looking for an 80% reduction in 75. 75 in to get in human interactions to have confidence to get R below 1, because we thought it was between 3 and 4. Um, that was not happening. So, so there, there are the two data points, if you like. That, that's very clear. The COBRA minutes of the Monday indeed show that the compliance rate was not up at 75%. But it describes the broad direction of travel as, as having some positive trends. Tube travel, shop, tendencies of shops and work and attendance and so on and so forth, showed that the, there were very significant drops in, in attendance. And, and so broadly speaking, there was a, a degree of significant compliance. But you've identified that the primary objective of the government was to take action to meet the reasonable worst-case scenario, that is to say, to make sure that it didn't come to pass in its full horror. But you'd taken very significant steps just three days before. Why procedurally, well, why not in terms of process, could you not have waited a few more days to see whether or not the steps you'd already taken would bring about the very response to the reasonable worst-case scenario that you had taken those steps in the first place to meet? Because we didn't just want to not hit the reasonable worst-case scenario of half a million deaths. We wanted to reduce that very significantly, not least to ensure that the NHS wasn't of, over... Of course. Over, I'm, I'm sorry. Of, of course. Strategically, that, that must be right. Yes. Let me put it another way. The... The plan was to reduce R below 1 yes. as quickly and as efficiently and as uh, uh, speedily as you could. On the Friday, you had introduced a suite of measures or a combined suite of measures designed to bring R below 1. On Friday, that is what you thought would do the trick. By Monday, there was a realisation it wouldn't work. It wasn't working, Cobra surmised because the data showed that the level of compliance with the measures weren't high enough. Why wasn't more time allowed to see whether they would reach that level of compliance, at which point you could be assured that the measures from the Friday were working? Two reasons. Firstly, because we expected that the impact on people's behaviour would start as a maximum and then degrade. Um, in the end, the public were brilliant at and... and um, that there wasn't that degradation at all, but that's what we were worried about. The second um, is that, from my point of view as the health secretary, my absolute, totally primary task at this point was to ensure that nobody went without NHS provision, and that needed a very significant reduction from the reason worst case scenario, and, and we only just got it low enough. So um, from my seat, I was just in favour of all the action you could possibly take. 
And I knew there'd be other voices that would argue for caution. And in fact, we did. The marginal item was whether we should mandate the closure of outdoor building sites. And in the end, we did not mandate that. Um, uh, but they almost entirely closed anyway. So um, there was a, of course, there was an argument about how far do we go. Um, and we effectively pulled every lever except that one. Um, and, uh, but the building trade decided to pull it for us. We're going to stop there, Mr. Yes. Chief. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to have rebelling, rebelling stenographers. Um, I'm sorry, because it is mid uh, discussion. I should come back at 25 past.
Mr Keith. M my lady, in the course of no doubt an overlong question, I suggested at some point earlier today that SAGE had not debated social distancing countermeasures until I said the 24th of March. In fact, it's the 25th of March. I think Mr Hancock thought it was the 26th of March. Uh, uh, February, I'm so sorry, February. Uh, I've been asked by Mr Hill um, to, to make absolutely clear, and I'm delighted to do so, there was a debate on the 4th of February at SAGE about um, face masks, schools, PP and a number of uh, a number of measures. On the 13th of February, there was a there was a debate about mass gatherings, school work, and prisons, and a number of other areas. And that the full suite, if if I may call them that, of um, countermeasures was discussed on the 25th. So the lockdown, being one example, was on the 25th. Um, one final question, please, in relation to the lockdown decision, Mr. Hancock. Could we just have up 274026? This is a, a summary, and I, the inquiry doesn't expect you to, to read through it or, or, or to recollect if you have the detail of it. It's a summary of the references from SAGE meetings, COBRA meetings, um, ministerial meetings, and so on and so forth, of how the likely damage to the NHS, the impact, was put at various times. So sometimes there are references to the NHS being overwhelmed, to it being overtopped. Mm. Um, if we can come forward, please, and it'll mean screwing through to about page seven or eight. A bit more, please. We've got there the 21st of March of the ministerial group meeting over the, over the weekend, where some figures are given about ITU beds. And this is just to get your bearings, Mr. Hancock. And then if we go further forward one page, we will see information from the chief executive of the NHS about the number of beds, ventilated beds, number yeah. of beds in London, and so on. You'll see that there is a reference by the government chief scientific advisor four lines down from the bullet point relating to him. The worst case scenario was that ITU capacity in London would be overwhelmed. So he uses the word overwhelmed in nine days' time. Yeah. But the projection, the actuality, 15 days. And then if we scroll through further in the document, you, you will see the 22nd of March ministerial group meeting, current number of deaths, number of beds and a reference to the drive to free up capacity. 23rd of March, of course, the Monday, how the NHS is being stretched in intensive care and over the page, page 11, the COBRA and the cabinet meeting, 23rd, 24th. It is obvious, and you've described to the inquiry how COBRA and the Prime Minister rationalised that the NHS would be overwhelmed at some point if R continued on its exponential growth and was not brought below one, inevitably as certain as night follows day, the NHS would collapse because of the sheer number of deaths. Yes. Not because of the sheer number of deaths, because of the cases. Cases and deaths. But but the point is that the NHS would not survive because of the nature of an exponential growth. To what extent did the government collectively have a view as to when that point might be likely to arrive. And I, I put it that way because you've explained, as has Professor Sir Chris Whitty, that the final analysis was based upon the correct understanding that an exponential yes. growth would only ever end in disaster for the NHS. For the NHS, yes. But, um, but could, could you, and were you able to go any further in terms of understanding when that was likely to be, w would it be an overtop? Would it be an overwhelming? Would it be a complete collapse? Would it be in a matter of weeks? Would surge capacity be able to ameliorate the position? Explain what so, level of understanding was. I mean, in a way, um, the, the true answer to that question is uh, nobody fully knew what that would look like, but we knew that it would be catastrophic. And um, in the paperwork, as you've just shown, um, when making the decision on the 23rd, 
the advice was nine days in the reasonable worst case scenario, 15 days in the central scenario. But at that point, I, my worry was we were going up the reasonable worst case scenario, notwithstanding the decisions we'd taken on the 16th and the 20th. Um, the, um, what, that would, what that would look like, what that would mean, would be people going without treatment. Um, and I was absolutely determined that that would not happen. Um, and, and that came back to the Nimbus uh, uh, discussion and other discussions around that. And so we took a huge amount of action. And I thought that Simon Stevens, Lord Stevens, uh, described that extremely well in his um, evidence. Um, the, uh, I, I pushed for him to expand both the physical capacity and expand the effective staffing. Because one of the one of the challenges that has been put at this stage is that, and it's some, in, there in some of the written evidence to the inquiry, uh, that we didn't know exactly how many beds the NHS had. In quotes, well, what matters is not a physical bed. What matters is a staffed bed, and that is flexible. In some cases, we took the staff ratio in intensive care normally one to one, up to six patients to one nurse. Um, so it is flexible. The NHS would, you, you said in your question, would the NHS have survived? Of course the NHS would have survived. It would have done its level best and is an amazing and adaptable institution full of extraordinary people. But it would not have been able to provide care to everybody. And therefore, the number of people who died would have gone up even more than it would have done just because of the virus. And therefore, is this a, a fair summary? Notwithstanding the remarkable ability of the NHS to cope, notwithstanding the flexibility that there may be in the system for an increase in staff beds, in ICU beds, in surge capacity, yes. notwithstanding that you could not know and you would never know at what point collapse would come, it was a risk that no Secretary of State responsible for public health could countenance. Yes, that is a good summary. Right. Some other issues, please, Mr. Hancock. Um, Public Health England, the inquiry has understood that Public Health England um, well, 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 was disbanded in the, in the middle of the pandemic, to use um, one of the witness statements. Did you have concerns? Um, about the ability of Public Health England in February, March, April to respond to the pandemic? And if so, was that a contributory factor to the disbandment of PHE and its substitution by the UK HSA? Yes, I did. Uh, Public Health England did an absolutely superb job, especially on the scientific uh, research and the best early example was developing the test in an extremely short period of time and in its lab work and its analysis uh, it was first rate its genomics program was uh, superb there was one point in the pandemic when we were sequencing half of the genomes of covid in the world however i, I my view on this accords uh, very closely with uh, chris wormwald's uh, evidence which is that its capacity to scale was simply not there. It hadn't had the experience of scaling. This isn't a criticism of any individuals. Um, it, it, it had a contact tracing system that was based on top quality, highly trained experts, um, whereas what we needed was much more like a, a, a call center Henry Ford style high volume contact tracing system that we eventually built. Um, it was deeply frustrating that there was an um, unenthusiasm, if I put it diplomatically, to engage private sector testing capacity. And I personally had to get involved in, um, in, in sorting that out. Um, Can I just pause you there? You refer in your statement to a, a particular problem in relation to the extent to which PHE found itself able to assist a particular commercial entity in its development of a test? No, the problem was that it wouldn't, they, it wouldn't engage any private commercial entity. I, there were a couple, which I mentioned in my statement, who I 
um, in, uh, asked them to contact because they'd come to me. Um, I wanted them to support any private entity that could expand testing. It wasn't about these particular companies. What right. I wanted was testing capacity. Um, and um, there was a view which was that there is, a, uh, across the country, a, a large number of very small university or hospital-based uh, and a couple of PHE-based labs, um, and that we should use these. But they were not of a... They were not scalable models. They were small, and they were essentially science, structured for science rather than structured for throughput. Um, and so my concerns with PHE were, were really about its inability to scale. That was the first. The second was about a longer-term uh, change that I thought was needed. Um, and this was the uh, problem of PHE having two goals. It is was, this the health improvement? Correct. It was health responsible prevention. for health improvement, that is, improvement of people's health when, so, with respect to non-communicable diseases, obesity being the most important, and anti-smoking drives, for instance, very, very, uh, very, PHE was very strong in these areas, um, as well as responsible for uh, communicable diseases, either the normal ones that happen all the time, you know, the occasional outbreak of Legionnaire's disease or um, Mpox or what have you, and preparation for very rare but extremely high consequence uh, communicable diseases akin to a pandemic. And um, I have a background in um, at the Bank of England. Um, and it is akin to financial stability. Most of the time, there isn't a problem with financial stability. But when there is a problem with financial stability, you absolutely need an institution that is going to lead in the response. And we have one. It's the Bank of England. All right. We did not have the equivalent. And now we do because of UXA. The second point you mentioned, the, the systemic change, if you like, to recognize that the new body focuses on, um, on health um, health prevention is, is, is plainly understood. Was it, in relation to the first point, though, truly the fault of Public Health England that it was unable to scale up the, the, the testing process? I mean, wasn't that a reflection of historical institutional failings? There just wasn't a system in place, and nobody, let alone PHE, could have scaled up in January, even if they'd been minded to do so. Uh, do you I think, practically, it had been open to them to take those steps, but that they failed to do so. I don't want to ascribe blame. Um, it, it would have been better for the UK response had those uh, companies that that are um, that were experienced in diagnostics, albeit relatively small scale, especially compared to some countries like Germany, um, had been given the full hearted support with the, sp the sputum they needed, for instance, early on. Uh, from mid-March, we did manage to develop this sort of capacity. Um, it was slower than it ought to have been. Um, and um, it's a vital, vital lesson for the future that we need a testing system ready to go. And I, I'm worried that uh, that is not there right now in case in case it's a pandemic. You know, maybe what happens if one of these thing, one of these diseases that we've read about in the last couple of weeks, so the the influenza in northern China, becomes pandemic? We need to be able to. My question now to the Secretary of State would be: How quickly can we get to 100,000 tests? How quickly are we going to get a vaccine? How quickly are we going to have 5,000 people in a call centre doing contact tracing? Do you happen to know for a fact whether or not the the hugely impressive and 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 extremely extensive testing system that was, of course, ultimately put into place has become degraded since the end of the crisis or whether it is still in place? No, of course it's been um, stepped down. Um, but, if, but you'd want to step some of it down. There's no, we built a capacity of almost a million tests a day. You don't need a million tests a day in normal times. What you need is the ability very rapidly to put it back in place. So, yes, for instance... It, I, Mr Hancock, I'm sorry to interrupt. You said, I'm worried that is there, not there right now. Correct. In case. So, so I'm, I'm asking you, do you know that it is now not there? Or are you saying it is still there, it's been stepped down reasonably but you've got concerns about whether it can be stepped back up. That is what I'm concerned about. For instance, there were recently the, one of the major labs 
uh, was put on the market, I think it would be better if it were mothballed and ready to go at, uh, at the flick of a switch. All right. I, and uh, can I just make one point on this? We spend £50 billion a year on physical defence, and we spend less than half a billion pounds a year on UXA. We spend less than 1% of our total budget for defence on health security, yet health security failings have killed more civilians than any other external threat since the Second World War, and maybe even uh, further back than that. And it, I think this is a spectacular imbalance in the amount of resources that we put into defence of this country against, uh, say, a terror threat compared to a health threat. And it, I, I've got one particular axe to grind. I, I attended the National Security Council in my role as Secretary of State occasionally. The, the head of UXA should be on the National Security Council all of the time, not just brought in when there's a health issue on the agenda, uh, because health security threats have been demonstrated to be the biggest threat to the civilian population of this country. Previous witness observed that had this been a threat yes. in national security terms rather <clears throat> yes. than a risk yes. in public health terms, that the government may have, well, it would have had different structures in place, but it may have, been, it may have responded significantly differently. It would have had basically the same structures in place. It would have used them. Imagine if I'd gone to... I'm, I'm going to ask you very, very politely, just, to, just not to go any further. We, 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 under, we understand, Mr Hancock, the point you make, and you've made this point in, in your witness statement. We, we understand the point about the difference between national security and threats and risks. One sentence. If, Go I'd, if I'd gone in mid-January to the Cabinet Secretary setting out a 50-50 chance of a terrorist threat that might kill half a million people, I think the, I think the Prime Minister would have chaired the COBRA, not me. Don't you? Uh, I did ask. I did answer the question to Mr Hancock. But there is obviously force in, in your observation. But, but can I ask you to move it forward, it may or may not be that the absence of a chairing of that first COBRA by the Prime Minister made a difference. That's a matter for my lady to determine. Can you go further and say that over the course of perhaps the following four weeks, yeah. there, was a, there would have been a material difference in the whole system yes. response? Yes. Right. So I didn't specifically mean the very first one. It was reasonable very early on. The responses were almost entirely within the health Remit that would have been like an MOD uh, minister, the the defence secretary chairing a Cobra on a defence matter, totally reasonable at first. But when it became clear this was a 50-50 threat, given the reasonable worst case scenario, then the whole national security secretariat and civil contingencies apparatus which exists should have been brought to bear on this crisis. And instead, what happened was a, a special advisor in number 10 decided to try to make all the decisions out of his office. And, Mr Hancock, again, you, you, you've overly focused, if I may say so, on, on the structure and the committee structure. My lady would be much more assisted, I think, by understanding whether, if it had been a national security threat, that not just would there have been changes in the application or the approach or the utilisation of the committee structure, but would there have been a material response in the way in which the government responded practically in terms of the measures, the actions, the steps it might thereafter then take? Yes. Right. Thank you. The 100,000 test goal of April. Yes. I, I don't wish to... To, um, to linger on this subject, it is self-evident that it was a very considerable and impressive feat to ramp up the testing so that we can understand what the debate is from 10,000 a day at the end of March to, to 100,000 a day at the end of April. The inquiry has, however, received or has seen that there is evidence in the WhatsApps and the, and, and the private communications that were considerable due of criticism of you in relation to, to, to that feat. I'd like to 
suggest to you, and, and you will have no doubt reflected upon this, that there doesn't appear to have been criticism of the result or the ambition, which, as I say, appear to be very impressive, but that there was a lack of coordination first, that appears to be one criticism, and secondly, a worry that by focusing on the end date, the end of April, and by pulling the system towards that focus, it may have taken necessary focus away from other areas for which testing was no less important. Do you understand the point? I, I, un, I, I've tried to understand this point. Uh, the, it doesn't have a logical basis, well, that, but it that was made so. at the time. You, do, we, we presume you will reject it. <laughs> yeah, certainly right. will. OK. But, uh, Mr Hancock, so for, uh, this, the, serious, for this, this reason, serious matters. It, it is very, very serious, because um, I now know that there were people actively working against me on it in the centre, which is appalling. Um, the just, just, pause, the, just pause there. The, the, is that because you say in your statement that Number 10 intervened in the ramping up of testing capacity, which made it harder to achieve the goal? That's well, your statement. Well, the, the, um, what Simon Case described to me as the long screwdriver, which is um, uh, relatively junior people in Number 10 uh, trying to go into the testing um, program at a level two Several, you know, too far down, too low, and issue diktats was deeply unhelpful over this uh, period. Um, but and proper lines of accountability would have been uh, following proper lines of accountability would have been much more effective. But that's that wasn't quite what I meant. What I meant was the criticism that um, instead of going for 100,000 tests, there were other things tests could have been used for. Is, a, is wrong and wrong in logic because we needed the tests. Of course, we also needed to work out what we were going to use the tests for, and that was essentially a clinical decision. But what I needed to do from when I took over the responsibility for testing in the middle of, on the March the 17th, um, was drive the system, galvanize the system, as somebody put it quite right, and announcing a target, even though I didn't know that we could hit it, which is unusual in government. Normally, people only do things they're pretty sure they can uh, achieve. Um, it, it, that was absolutely critical to driving the expansion of testing, uh, which was so necessary uh, in the rest of the uh, response. Um, it is, uh, of course, it's frustrating to me that in so doing, um, and in, in, in taking that approach, I uh, obviously some people were, were upset by it. I, 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 it baffles me why people were against uh, the, uh, the expansion of testing in that All way. Right. On the 1st of May, the Cabinet Secretary WhatsApped you to say, Hi, Matt, well done this evening, creative counting and 122,000. Um, you respond, although it looks like question marks. In fact, it was a three-kiss emoji. Um, I told you we got on well. Well, yes, but you appear also to be accepting his um, perhaps jocular observation that you'd engage in creative counting. Um, the, this reference is about how we went about uh, counting a, a new innovation, which was tests that people did at home, on which there was work in the department the uh, permanent secretary... Mr Hancock, I'm so sorry. In the interest of time, can I just ask you, and I'm doing this in order to be scrupulously fair to you, do you accept or reject the suggestion of creative counting? Uh, I reject it, and on every different way you could possibly count these measures, we hit that target. All right. Um, care homes. The detail of the care, adult care sector is for a later module, as I know you know. Um, but a considerable amount of evidence has been given by the by in the context of this module about the, the centre of government's understanding of what the position was, firstly, in relation to the discharge of patients from hospital to the care sector, and secondly, the extent of the testing that was available 
both for patients and also for staff in the care sector thereafter and at a later stage. Yeah. And, and therefore, I, I need to ask you briefly again what, what your reaction is. The evidence has been given to, to this effect that, that and, and you've already referred to this, that the government's starting point is, of course, that local authorities manage and deal with, with risks in adult social care. That was evidence from Sir Chris um, Wormald. But it was also recognised, particularly in March, that the care sector presented particular vulnerabilities and problems. That was recognised in February when we saw that older people were m the most vulnerable. Yes, I, I refer to March because you opened a coronavirus and social care meeting, a specific meeting on this issue on the 6th of March, and, and you, you refer to the higher risks attendant upon the sector. Um, on the 17th of March, the government announced, well, NHS England issued a letter, as you'll, you'll well recall, requesting all parts of the NHS to free up maximum inpatient and critical care capacity. And the government issued its hospital discharge requirements on the 19th of March. And thereafter, patients began to be moved when they were medically able to do so from hospitals to the care sector. Can you please make absolutely plain whether or not those discharges to care homes from the 18th of March onwards were contingent in any way upon a negative test being available and applied? In March, they were not. Were any assurances given by you or others that testing would be in place for patients discharged from that date onwards? The assurances that I gave were the were very precisely the policies that were in place at that time. It's not a trap. There were, as far as we can tell, no assurances given by anybody that anybody would be tested from the 18th of March prior to discharge. It's, it's plain. Yeah, I've been, uh, I've been accused of various things over this. Uh, the, the, um, if, if, will you bear with me? I, I'm, okay. I'm going to come to the, the substance of the debate in a moment. But, but I, I wish you to, to acknowledge that the suggestion that from the 18th of March, patients should have been tested but were not, has, has, has no legs in it. There were no assurances. No, the, we didn't have enough tests. It, precisely. Um, there is a DHSC document dated the 2nd of April, 233798. And it says on page 4, negative tests, you, you can see it's the sentence towards the bottom, Mr. Yeah. Negative tests are not required prior to transfers of admissions into the care home. That's right. But on page five, there was guidance given that any care home resident presenting with symptoms... Yeah. I've now lost... Ah, oh, yes, thank you very much. Any resident presenting with symptoms of COVID-19 should be promptly isolated and separated in a single room with a separate bathroom. If, of course, as we can see from the heading, they were already residents. Yes. Right. So, so that's very clear. <coughs> Subsequently, and I don't want to go through the detail of them, there were announcements about testing of symptomatic care home staff. Yes. 15th of April. There was an action plan for adult social care. There was an announcement on the 28th of April for asymptomatic staff and resident care homes for over, the six, over 65s. Another announcement on the 7th of June, all about testing. Yes. Was the core point this, that whilst the government could announce a policy of testing, because for the very reason you've identified there was a shortage of testing, it could give no guarantees as to whether testing in reality would meet that aspiration. Out with your control, there may and were have been occasions, maybe many occasions, when testing was not available due to the exigencies of the system. But that's nothing to do with the policy announced by government. Is that, is that a fair summary? Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit more complex than that. And if I might have do. the opportunity to set it out a little bit. Um, the... There, it is certainly true that, especially in a pandemic, 
if you make a policy decision at the centre, then it takes time and it is sometimes uneven in how that is promulgated. That's true across all policy, especially when done at pace. Um, nevertheless, even having said that, the testing policies were, uh, that we put in place for adult social care were essentially based on clinical advice of what tests would be reliable and effective, combined with the operational advice of how many tests were available. <coughs> So, for instance, there was a discussion on the 14th of April when clinical advice for the first time said, yes, you can test asymptomatic people and the a negative test will be reliable, really important, apropos <coughs> our earlier discussion. Um, but then we combined that with the operational advice as to how many tests were available by that stage around 35,000. And you can see, for instance, in INQ 00029268, that then the clinical advisors, in this case the CMO, came back and then signed off on and ad issued new advice as to what the policy should be for testing. So the testing rules, who got the test, what the policy was, what order of priority we used tests in, was based on clinical advice throughout. All right. Th that is understood, and nobody has suggested otherwise. The point I'm making is a different one, which is the DHSC, your clinical advisors, whoever it was who promulgated the policies, could not day in, day out, practically at, at residential care sector level, yeah. guarantee everybody a test or, or practically make them available. This was an extremely complex, difficult system, and you could not ensure or guarantee that there would be tests available for everyone in accordance with the policy. So it's, it's that, impossible. Yes. However, what I'm saying is when we were de devising the policy, we tried to take that into account as much as possible, sure. but you can't take it into account entirely. Of course. I mean, that's, if I may say, it's an obvious point. Yeah. So yeah. in the WhatsApp group to which you were a contributor, the, 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 the group I've mentioned earlier, CSA, CMO, Matt, PM, Dom. Yeah. You will recall, Mr. Hancock, that in May, Mr. Cummings says, I don't understand why we're still not testing more care home staff, including asymptomatic. Yeah. And Sir Patrick Vallon says, the testing is fully owned in DHSC. If we don't get on top of the spread, we risk the rest. And, and you say, we've been doing this for the past week, and that's dated the 3rd of May, and that must be a reference back to probably the 28th of April policy, or, or perhaps one of the earlier policies. Mr Cummings, as you know, sends round a message saying, we're negligently killing the most vulnerable, and I'm extremely worried. Trying to, to be as neutral as you can in terms yeah. of your deans with Mr Cummings, was this um, explosive, uh, the, the communications are very explosive, this explosive row as to what was being done, a reflection of that difficulty that policy may not reflect the reality of what tests were actually in place up and down the land in the care sector. It was a reflection, in my opinion, of two things. The first is that, that uh, it's, it, it, you can you can find examples on the ground where the policy set in Whitehall doesn't um, match entirely. But it's also a reflection of the fact that, unfortunately, the Prime Minister's chief advisor didn't always try to ascertain the facts before making uh, comments. Um, he did this over the testing target towards the end of March, which we hit when he pro provided misinformation to the Prime Minister. Well, Mr Hancock, and, and I'm, I'm, I've, and given you, I've given you ample opportunity <laughs> to comment on the allegations that Mr Cummings has made about you. The you point is they're them. false. So you can't actually take anything that he wrote in that as, as true, because in that case it didn't accord with the facts. In, and I just gave another example. And therefore it's quite difficult to answer in a substantive way about the planning of future pandemics when the, the, the comments that I was receiving uh, were not based on the truth. All right. Protective ring. On the 15th of May, you said at a Downing Street press conference, right from the start, it's been clear that this horrible virus affects older people most. 
So right from the start, we've tried to throw a protective ring around our care homes. And you say, we've tried. You denied on a, on a show on the 6th of June using the words right from the start. And in another place in Parliament, and I breach no parliamentary privilege rule by stating as a matter of fact, because I'm not addressing the merits of what we said in Parliament, you said we absolutely did throw a protective ring around social care. So that's the context. Going back to the press conference, you said right from the start, it's been clear we tried to throw a protective ring. Do you acknowledge that the, the phrase trying to throw a protective ring and the reference right from the start was open to interpretation? People would take from those words what they wished, and there's certainly an argument for saying that that was giving the clear impression that there was an impermeable barrier, whether in terms of finance, fiscal support, testing, or discharge staff residential movements within the care sector. I entirely understand why people feel strongly about this. Um, what I, when I first said that, I then went on to explain what I meant, that we'd put over £3 billion into the care sector in, April, in March and April, uh, that we'd released uh, PPE, free PPE, uh, that we'd put in place infection control guidance based on the scientific advice, um, etc. And in fact, in that press conference, I went on to list the different things that we were doing. And in, in fact, as part of the plan we were launching that day, um, we made another £600 million available for infection control purposes. Um, and so I was trying to simply summarise that we had taken action um, and, I, and, and I set out the action. Th that is understood. Uh, I cannot improve on the glorious words of um, Professor Sir Jonathan Van Dam, who says in his statement, my view is a ring is a circle without a break in it. Whatever however you describe the protective processes you put in place around the care sector, they did not form a, an unbroken circle, did they? It is quite clear from the evidence that Professor Van Tam is right. Yeah, thank you. Um, on the 13th of May, so around the, the, the same time, could we have 102709? And it's the 13th of May entry at 12.47. And it may be page 219, but I'll be corrected if I'm wrong. 13th of May, 12.47. Mm. Oh, yes, there we are. Thank you very much. Um, there's a reference to um, Jamie Nujoku Goodwin. Yes. Is he one of your advisors or is he... Yes, he was, my, he was my media advisor at the time. Uh, he's now director of strategy in number 10. Matt, we might have some issues with you telling the Prime Minister we locked down care homes before the rest of the country. So this is your advisor telling you that there, there may be a need to correct either directly or indirectly, an impression seemingly given by you in your communications with the Prime Minister. And, and the rest of the page and the next two pages deal with your debate about whether there was a justification for using those words and how it might be justified retrospectively. What was that debate about? In what way did the Prime Minister believe that, or your aide believe, that um, by saying we locked down the care homes, you might not have been entirely accurate? Well, it depends on how you define lockdown. Um, and if you just tell us, tell us the debate. Do, in what way do you say you didn't say anything misleading, and in what way was it being suggested against you that you had? Well, it, it, it depends on uh, whether you define the actions that were taken in the uh, publication on the 13th of March, that guidance, as lockdown or not. Um, and... Um, Unless we, so it was I'm in the debate. The it was in the context of the 13th of March measures. Is, yes, is because, the because the 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 
critique being put at the time was that we um, took action to protect people in care homes later than locking down the rest of the country. And that was not true because we took action on the 13th of March with respect to uh, care homes. Uh, whether that action was strong enough or not to call it lockdown, for instance, it included visitor restrictions, I think, um, is that's the point of debate. I think the in fact, is Mr. Njoku Goodwin sets out at the bottom of the page in his WhatsApp what the measures were from the 13th of March. Those are the 13th of March measures, aren't they? To minimise the risk of transmission, care home providers are advised to review their visiting policy by asking no one to visit who has suspected COVID-19 or is generally unwell, and by emphasising good hand hygiene for visitors Contractors should be kept to a minimum. The review should consider the well-being of residents. In no universe, Mr Hancock, could those measures possibly be described as locking down the care homes. I think that's what Jamie was trying to tell me. All right. Thank you. Um, another hugely... Um, well, it became a very divisive issue again... Um, was the moving of personnel between care homes. Yes. Um, your statement makes plain yeah. that you became aware of initial evidence showing yes. that the movement of staff between care homes was the main source of transmission. Yeah. And I pause there simply to say, um, I don't intend to ask you any questions, and I would be grateful if you don't answer or try to give yeah. an answer about the degree to which the discharge of patients from hospital contributed to infections in the care homes as opposed yeah. to the movement of staff. That's yeah. for another time. Um, but you, you became aware of evidence saying that the movement of staff was the main source of transmission. Yes. Sir Patrick Valance has, through his evening notes, said that, or suggested that he had been telling you for some time before that date, before the 11th of May, that the movement of persons behind, uh, between care homes was a significant issue. And he says, we raised it in February, and he'd been told by you that the movement of care homes wasn't going to be stopped because it was essential for that sector. Would you just briefly say whether or not you accept the suggestion that Sir Patrick Valance had been trying to raise the issue with you before, but had made no progress, or do you deny that suggestion that you were late to this particular um, issue um, and um, only moved belatedly? Uh, the challenge here is that there was a uh, balance between two very difficult problems. And many problems during the pandemic, many decisions, were about balancing two unpalatable outcomes. Early in the pandemic, we were acutely aware of care homes in other countries where, in particular, there was an example in Spain that was very vivid in my memory, where there hadn't been enough staff. In that case, there were no staff and the residents had died. Sadly, in care homes, people are both most vulnerable to the virus and most in need of human interaction uh, for their well-being and ultimately uh, to, to live day to day. So we were very, very worried about not having enough staff to keep people alive at the same time as being very worried about the transmission of the virus. Now, of course, it comes down to the assumption you made about asymptomatic, make about asymptomatic transmission, and it comes down to the balance between these two awful considerations. By April, um, when the, uh, when there was more uh, when we had more time and the care sector had had time to get its, uh, to, to deal with the logistical problems of, of restricting staff movement, uh, we then took action, which I think we announced in the middle of May. So, so I, I would, my explanation for why uh, Patrick might feel that way is that this, there is a scientific argument on one, the one hand and there is an operational argument on the other. And um, some of his greatest frustrations were when the scientific requirement and the operational constraints were in conflict with each other, as they were in this case. Forgive me, 
the very difficult conundrum faced by government is, is obvious. I wasn't asking about that. I was asking you whether there is any truth to the suggestion that Sir Patrick Vallance had asked you and had told you that the issue of moving people between care homes was important and that you had rejected that as an issue. He says, I got told off. And, and that you only belatedly appreciated that there was a very real problem. Is that true or not? That is not correct. It's not a fair reflection of my, my position. Firstly, um, I, I wouldn't deign to tell off Patrick Valance, who is a very eminent uh, scientist and uh, businessman. Um, uh, also, uh, my challenge at the time as Secretary of State, indeed our challenge both as a department and with the care sector, who we discussed these matters with, was this balance between the need, the absolute need to have staff and the imperative to uh, reduce transmission which was carried by staff. And these two difficult considerations were in conflict. It is not reasonable to just take one side of that argument. You have to take both into account. Moving on, um, a couple of um, discrete issues, please. In your witness statement at paragraph 393, you refer to, um, in the context of the devolved administrations, to difficulties uh, encountered by the United Kingdom government associated with the Scottish government taking, um, I'll summarize it in this way, um, different positions presentationally or, or yes. politically, notwithstanding a, a common clinical position. Yes. So taking a presentational political angle on matters which were understood to be common ground clinically. Yes. Um, to what is that a reference? Well, we worked very well together at health minister, health secretary uh, level, um, and there's evidence of that in the, in the WhatsApps. Um, and we, and at, I know that at CMO level, they worked very well together, and Chris Whitty has uh, testified to that. Um, the challenge was that when decisions went up from our level to first minister and prime ministerial level, um, there would sometimes be an agreement on what to do, but someone would go ahead and announce it beforehand, causing confusion, or a choice to do something which was substantively the same but presentationally uh, different or marginally different, uh, which I thought in some cases was for the sake of presentation. My starting point was the, the scientific point, which is that we, we live on an island or a set of islands, and the, and the virus does not recognise administrative boundaries, even ones that are centuries old, like the Scottish and Welsh borders, and it is necessary to take decisions across the whole island um, that, are, that are consistent. And there was also, obviously, a communications challenge uh, with the public. So um, it was, I found it unfortunate that sometimes, not all the time by any stretch, but sometimes when decisions went up, uh, in particular in Scotland, um, the, and in particular at first minister level, uh, there would then be a uh, there would then be a, a political angle or presentational angle put on a decision based on the same science. It was it was frustrating. Moving now to the summer of 2020, mm. without going into the detail of the, um, the the plan to rebuild or or the exit from the first national lockdown. <laughs> it's plain, Mr. Hancock, that there was a vigorous debate about the speed at which the country should come out of the measures. And um, a debate about the speed at which the particular phases of the roadmap should be proceeded through. Yeah. Um, your statement suggests that you had significant concerns about whether or not step three of the roadmap went too far, because it was obvious that cases were rising again. Uh, and you also questioned the tone and ambition of, of government publications, in particular 
one of the chapters of the plan to rebuild. Can you remind me of the date of step three? Um, it's phase three. Um, I don't think I can assist on the particular yeah. date yeah. of that it, phase. It, it matters not because it's, okay. it's obvious it was in, in May. The, 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 the cases only started. Cases started rising mid July. That's when I really started worrying. Yes, but but your statement says step three went too far as cases began rising again. And I see. You, yes. You also subsequently yeah. in July later expressed concern to the prime minister about the speed of release. Yes. I, I don't want to, I don't yeah. want to trouble you with the detail, but but in this general debate about yes. caution against speed of release. Yes. You you were you were for caution. Yes. To what extent were your concerns heard and reflected in the government's position thereafter? Well, they were heard and they were reflected, I guess, in as much as it might have been more, uh, there might have been more opening had I not made these uh, arguments. My entire strategy at this point was to try to keep R below one. Um, I thought that it was alongside, I was completely alongside Chris Whitty during this period on this strategy, which was... Um, summer is the best time to release. If R goes a bit above one over the summer, not the end of the world so long as cases are very low, but then we'll have to take action in the early autumn to get it down again. Um, the, but the critical thing is to keep it uh, under control. And in this period, I articulated the, what I regarded as the government strategy, which was we suppress the virus until a vaccine can make us safe. Now, I, after articulating that a few times, I then got asked by number 10 not to say it because we didn't know we'd get a vaccine. But I was confident by this point that we would get one. And anyway, I couldn't see any other way through this without far too many deaths. When were you asked by number 10 not to say it? Uh, I can't remember. It was in a press conference. Uh, we would be able to, we should be able to find the paperwork if we dig further for it. Um, it well, was, just assist us roughly. It, was, we will, it will have been in a press conference in um, July or August. Your, your statement says in terms that you believe that step three of the, 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 the roadmap went too far, which tends to suggest that your concerns were not reflected in the outcome of that roadmap because step three had been promulgated. You thought they went too far, but so, it couldn't be reversed. It was certain, certainly not... Um, not fully reflected, um, but uh, you know, as throughout the autumn, the prime minister balanced uh, economic and health considerations, and I made the health argument as well as I could. And uh, you know, this so this was an early precursor to the much more uh, involved debates over September and October. Do you recall ONS data being released on the 29th of July? Yes, I remember that we the number of cases bottomed out on the 13th of July, and I remember the ONS, which came out a little bit later but was more robust. Um, the ONS survey would come out um, shortly after that. The ONS data of that date show, according to your statement, and, and it, it is, of course, right, that cases had risen, and to use your word, dramatically. Yes, from a very low base, but yes. Um, did you know in advance of the Eat Out to Help Out scheme? Um, no, that was announced on the, not ahead of its announcement on the 8th of July. No. In fact, cases were still falling at that point. Did you raise your concern when the scheme was announced? And of course, it was announced in advance of the beginning of August and, and meant to take effect on... 3rd of August, I think. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays for those four weeks of August? Um, the, I didn't know about the Eat Out to Help Out scheme until the, um, the Cabinet meeting on the morning of its uh, announcement. And um, it was one of a package of loosenings. Um, we were doing a number of things to uh, bring back uh, a bit of freedom over the summer. As the Secretary of State for Health, had you been told and had you been asked for your view, what would you have said? Um, I don't know. Well, Mr Hancock, you've told the inquiry that there is in this debate between caution and allowing release, and it's a difficult debate, a public health view, yeah. which you as the Secretary of State are plainly on the side of caution. Yes. Because that's your job. What mattered in, that in the opening then 
was that there wasn't overall too much. And in the end, there was overall too much. Which individual items you, of, of opening you did or didn't do is second order compared to the overall amount of openings. I was at the same time campaigning to internally to get uh, funding so that those who tested positive would isolate, which we eventually got put in place in September. And I thought that was the most important use of money. Did you express serious reservations about the scheme once you became aware of it, given your well-known position as Secretary of State for Health on the balance between release and positive promotion of eating out and caution? Once it was announced it was a, a done deal that it was government policy, um, I, um, I expressed caution and um, argued very strongly against its extension at the end of August. And um, I don't think its extension was ever seriously in prospect. So you did argue very strongly against it, did you? I argued that it shouldn't be extended. Um, it was a, a serious issue, though, was it not, in terms of the, the possible, and I'm not going to go into the debate about what the impact actually was in terms of prevalence, but in terms of at least the perception in intervention areas, it was a serious problem. Uh, in intervention areas, it was unhelpful to be that the state should be subsidising people to go out at the same time as asking people to be more cautious. It's, um, it was serious. Well, what I'd say is that I, I think there has been undue focus on this one item. And uh, where the then Chancellor what is absolutely right in his statement is he argues that this was not the sole cause of the second wave. Um, I, Mr. What matters Hancock, is, I, I've deliberately uh, not asked you. you. What, ma what matters was the overall, what Chris Whitty at the time called the R budget, the overall set of measures. My goal was to keep R below one. If keeping R below one with a tighter set of measures elsewhere, uh, but with this scheme in place, if that could have kept R below one, I would have been happy with it. Um, and if uh, within the debate and negotiation, if, that, if it was easier to get, keep the, the Chancellor in a good place on other measures that were necessary um, in order to keep R below one as a whole, then tactically that would be something I'd be happy with. That what matters here is the overall budget and keeping R below one. In the end, that loosening was too much. Eat Out to Help Out was just one of many measures. And in effect, with hindsight, you can go through and you can look at you know, 10 measures and say, we, in the end, could have afforded seven of these. Um, and, 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 and whether Eat Out to Help Out is on that list or not is, is a moot point. That was the attitude that I took. I wanted to keep R below one. 129458 is a WhatsApp from you to Simon Case. Just want to let you know directly, we've had lots of feedback that Eat Out to Help Out is causing problems in our intervention areas. I've kept it out of the news, but it's serious. This is you, Mr Hancock. Yes. Have you told Rishi? And then Mr Case says again, I don't think he can afford to extend it. And then you, yes, we've told Treasury, we've been protecting them in the comms, and thankfully it hasn't bubbled up. Yes. So the position you took was indeed that it was serious, that's your word. Yes. That you told the Treasury. Yes. But whilst you did so, you protected the Treasury in the news, you concealed your concerns about the seriousness of the impact of this scheme, and you expressed thanks, gratitude, it hadn't come to light. That's because I abide by collective responsibility. And I was being encouraged by various journalists who would presume that I was um, against it uh, to criticise the then uh, Chancellor. But I believe that government is a team effort. And so I didn't want um, that to become a row in public. I mean, there's you can see during the whole pandemic the corrosive effect of leaks. Um, and uh, I, I was, I was not part of that, and I don't appreciate, I don't appreciate uh, government by leak, and hence I abided by collective responsibility on and off the record. That's what I'm saying there. 
as we are all aware, um, in the autumn, rates continued to go up, prevalence went up. There was a rule of six introduced. Um, in the context of this debate between relaxation, promoting the economy, and caution and keeping R below one, um, did the Prime Minister take a consistent approach to one or the other sides of that argument? I think it's fair to say that the Prime Minister felt strongly the arguments for the protection of health and the arguments for liberty and the protection of the economy. Uh, my particular beef was that I didn't think there was a trade-off at all. And the, it, there wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't an either or. You couldn't choose between either. And my intense frustration was that economists at the Treasury and elsewhere couldn't see that, it, that although you could protect the economy by not locking down this week or next week, the consequence, the second round consequence of that um, would be a firmer, more economically damaging lockdown in the future. And you know, as a trained economist and knowing some of them, you know, the second round impact of a decision is what economics is all about. And they, I couldn't get them to see it. It was deeply frustrating that it was against the economic interest as well as against the health interest uh, to, uh, to avoid the action that was necessary. The Prime Minister saw it as, a, as, as both, and he felt very keenly the, um, the, 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 the instincts on both sides. In your book for the 26th of August, it, it purports to be a diary entry, but we now know that these are not diary entries. Not now, no. I was clear when I published it. For all our best efforts to avoid chaotic lurching, the Prime Minister has veered off. Do you recall writing that in your book? Uh, I do, and I remember that period. Yes. So the answer to, your, to the question I put, which is, did the Prime Minister take a consistent line, is not that he was conscious of the debate, both sides but that you used your efforts as well as the efforts of others to avoid chaotic lurching on his part. And the clear impression you give in your own book, Mr Hancock, is that yet again he had veered off. What period are we talking about? 26th of August. So August, late August was frustrating because in July the Prime Minister had been extremely concerned that there was a second wave and it's reflected in the... Uh, the, uh, the various communications, and then um, came back from holiday and was much more concerned uh, with not locking down, and I found that uh, a problem. Mr Hancock, they're your words. Chaotic lurching. That's not entirely similar to suggesting that he was reasonably and sensibly taking a different view in light of new information or scientific advice. Is it? There's a, there are different degrees of diplomacy with which you can answer, give an answer to the same question. In September, as you've indicated, and as your statement makes plain, that the data shows that in infection rates were going up. And, and in a very broad sense, the country was faced with a scenario similar to that faced at the end of February. That that's what you suggest in your statement. Yeah. Um, Actually, case rates were higher than at the end of February. Yeah. Well, that, that is your assessment, you say, similar to that face at the end of February. Um, what, in general terms, as the Secretary of State, was your position in, in September? Were you arguing for, at that early stage, circuit breaker, which is a, a, a short lockdown, if you like, I suppose, or, or a, a longer national lockdown, or, or were you calling for the better implementation of local restrictions, or, or, or perhaps beefed up rules of six, or whatever? Well, what, was, what was your position? Uh, my, my position was to argue first and foremost for tougher local lockdowns and the tiers system with a stronger top tier, um, and 
I first put that forward at the end of August to my own team. We worked it up and took it to a COVID-O in the middle of September. Um, and it, it was very frustrating that it took me a month to get that policy in place. Even more frustrating was that the top tier was not enough to get our below one and therefore um, and therefore not effective for the, for the task. Um, that was deeply frustrating. Um, the second thing was where national measures like the Rule of Six were proposed, I was an enthusiastic supporter of them. And, and the inquiry asks, of course, and without getting into the detail, um, because Spy MO yeah. on the 16th of September mooted a planned circuit breaker f around the October. Sorry, I didn't answer on circuit half, breaker. Yeah. Exactly, on the October half term. And on the 17th of September, SAGE recommends a, a circuit breaker. Yeah. And then you'll recall that the COVID task force on the 19th of September. I'm sure you'll recall this, put forward to the Prime Minister a, a number of different measures, package A, package B, package C, and a circuit breaker. Yeah. Where were you between the 17th and the 20th of September on the circuit breaker proposition? I was in favour of tougher measures that could get our below one, especially in the uh, areas where intervention was most needed because cases were highest. Um, I, I, was, I was not convinced by the circuit breaker proposal on two grounds. The first is it's effectively just a short lockdown. And if you put it in for two weeks, I could see why, in theory, if, if for two weeks no human would come into contact with any other human, then the case numbers would drop dramatically. But in the real world, that isn't how life works. For instance, in hospitals and care homes, people have to interact. And secondly, the political impact of repeat circuit breakers would have been to lose the, the confidence um, of those who uh, we needed to have on board to make it happen. Um, and I thought we would. I thought that therefore a circuit breaker was not the best approach because basically rates would just shoot up afterwards. That is what happened when they tried one in Wales. I was more strongly in favour. The thing I wanted to see was action to keep R below one. Um, and the way that I thought that was best organised was a degree of national action and then the tiers system, making sure you could get, get the thing, the, the, uh, the pandemic under control where it was most um, virulent. That was my view at the time. I can, I can go through with hindsight what I now think of it. Well, before you look at the hindsight angle, you say in your statement there were no excuses second time round. Yes, yeah. is a in relation to the second lockdown. Yeah. Case numbers rose from mid-July 2020. Yeah. And it was clear, so this isn't hindsight, this is reality. Yeah. It was clear that a second wave was coming from late August. Indeed, I said so on the record. I began to call for measures to suppress, yes. not mitigate, but suppress the virus in early September. Yes. The only possible strategy was to suppress the virus. Until a it, vaccine came good. I regret I was unable to win that argument. Yes. Why did you not lend your support to the scientific advice, which was to the effect that a circuit breaker in September was required? Well, that wasn't the uh, unanimous scientific advice. Mr Hancock, SAGE recommended a circuit breaker on the 17th of September. If I can finish my sentence. Because I discussed it with the chief medical officer at the time, and his view was subtly different to Sage's. He thought we needed to put in the restrictions necessary to get our below one in a way that would hold consistently through the winter. Um, and I thought that was a better proposition. Now, with hindsight, should I have teamed up with uh, the formal Sage conclusions, etc.? Well, it would have been better to have something rather than nothing. But my concern with a circuit breaker, even with hindsight, is that coming in and out and in and out of lockdown is not sustainable. It is not fair on the public, and it would have lost support uh, among, in, amongst legislators, and I don't think it would have worked. With hindsight, the tiers system didn't work because where we did put... It, it didn't work, firstly, because I wasn't allowed to have a top tier that was strong enough, but even if we had, people just moved. You know, I, I came up... We came up with the tiers system 
to make sure that people in areas of low prevalence didn't get the full whack of, uh, of lockdown measures. Um, and it is on, you know, because I, I cared about places like Herefordshire and Cornwall that hardly had any cases. And it seemed unfair that they should be locked down because other places had higher prevalence. But the truth is people travelled and the spread came out. And Patrick Valance was right about his critique of tears in his evidence. So I would not recommend tears for the Can I interrupt future. to say, we'll do with, we're going to deal with tears in the morning. Okay. On this issue of why you didn't endorse as the Secretary of State for Health, the person whom, by your own words, was bound to take... The, because it wouldn't, the, public, it wouldn't, the public health position. Because it wouldn't have worked in practice, and when it was tried in Wales, it didn't work. What we needed was a consistent lockdown for the winter that would have you, kept our below one. On the 17th of September, you, you, uh, 17th of September, you couldn't have known that the lockdown in Wales wouldn't have worked. It hadn't been put into place. And weren't you meant to be following the science? No, I was meant to be guided by the science. That was my whole approach. Guided by the science, but if I thought, as I thought on this, that it wouldn't work then I would uh, take another decision. And anyway, in discussions with the chief medical officer, who was my principal um, clinical advisor, um, the, we both we, we thought, or at least he thought it was um, reasonably arguable, that a, a, a single consistent policy to keep R below 1 uh, would have been better. I just don't think in, out, in, out, in, out would have worked over the winter. My lady, is, is that, that where you'd like to finish the evening? Please. Well, you've had a very long um, day, Mr. I'm sorry we can't finish you today, but I think you were warned that we'd have to ask you to come back tomorrow. There are quite a few questions from core participants, so as soon as um, Mr. Keith is concerned, we'll start those. Uh, we will definitely conclude your evidence before I break for lunch. So. I'm available as long as you need me. Thank you very much. 10 o'clock tomorrow, please.